Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thanks for thanks for being here uh, this morning. I hope you enjoyed uh, the first social uh, yesterday. And I mean, today uh, promises to be a, an exciting day as well, both scientifically and from the, the social perspective. Uh, so it's great to have you here. Uh, so let's start the, the, the day today with a, with a very exciting uh, talk uh, from uh, Professor uh, Muinat Bell, uh, who is going to present us her uh, work uh, on deep learning for ultrasound image formation, uh, probably uh, diving into as well the, the field of, of photoacoustics imaging uh, slightly, I guess. Um, so Prof, uh, Prof Bell is, is um, heading a, a very interdisciplinary um, research program um, based at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and this interdisciplinary research program is, is um, illustrated by the fact that she has three different appointments within Johns Hopkins in, in uh, three dif different departments. Uh, so computer science, biomedical engineering, and, and, uh, um, and electrical engineering. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to, to have her here and, and uh, present her work. Um, so before heading her, her lab at Johns Hopkins, uh, she, she, um, she did her, her undergrad at MIT, uh, then PhD at Duke, um, worked as well in, in London uh, for a bit, and then uh, came back to the US uh, where, where she's at, at Hopkins now. Uh, she won uh, numerous awards, uh, including the the, the well-known um, MIT um, um, Under 35 uh, Innovator Award. Um, um, there's an NSF Career Award as well and an NIH uh, Trailblazer Award. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, invite the speaker on stage and let's get a round of applause. Thank you. So thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to be here to give this keynote presentation today. It is my pleasure to talk to you about ultrasound image formation in the deep learning age. So many of you are familiar with ultrasound. It's ubiquitous in the clinic, and this is a standard clinical setup showing a sonographer holding an ultrasound probe and viewing an ultrasound image on the screen. Now, the first medical image was created in the 1950s, and in the 60-year history of ultrasound, the fundamental signal processing has remained the same in the sense that images created with this setup shown here all rely on the fundamental beamforming stack. By the end of this talk, I hope to give you a greater appreciation of the ultrasound image formation process and the beamforming process, where we start with raw data that looks something like this, and we pass it through beamforming in order to achieve the image that the sonographers see on the screen. And then we might be interested in applying some additional post-processing to extract structures of interest, such as image segmentation. Now, the deep learning community has traditionally applied deep learning algorithms to the beamformed image in order to segment structures of interest. What I'm doing that's new and different is I'm starting with the same raw data and I'm bypassing the mathematical component of image formation and replacing that with deep learning in order to segment a more easier to interpret image. The key questions I'd like to get us thinking about throughout this keynote presentation and beyond is first, how can we start with the raw data and combine multiple image enhancement methods and segmentation options in one step with the assistance of deep learning? Second, can we use deep learning to fundamentally improve the presentation of today's images? And I explore these questions with the overarching goal of simplifying clinical procedures, enhancing, imaging, enhancing image interpretation, and ultimately enabling more widespread use of ultrasound that may, uh, by those who may have less training with interpreting the images. So all in support of improved patient care. So for the remainder of this talk, I'll give you a brief overview as to why these are critical questions for us to be thinking about, and then I'll transition more, to tell you more about the beamforming process 
And then I will talk about our deep learning approaches to replace beamforming in both ultrasound and a related imaging method called photoacoustic imaging. And then I'll describe our GAN approach as our first attempt to combine multiple images to or combine um, different networks to give multiple outputs from a single input. And then I'll end with my summary and outlook. So as I mentioned, ultrasound is ubiquitous in the clinic. It can be used to visualize an array of different anatomical structures as shown here. There are several primary benefits of ultrasound over existing um, medical images that are used in the clinic today, such as it being safe, it doesn't require ha uh, harmful ionizing radiation, it can be portable, it could fit in the clinician's pocket, it is cost effective, and it can provide real-time views of anatomy as you see here with your very eyes, you're seeing the left ventricle of a beating heart of one of the uh, patients that I image, and it can also be used to provide both diagnostic and surgical information. Despite these many benefits, there have been several outstanding challenges that have persisted in the 60-year history of ultrasound images. So ultrasound images are known to be very noisy. They're known to contain a granular texture appearance known as speckle. They're known to attain, uh, uh, contain acoustic clutter, which basically causes signals to appear in regions where there should be none. And these images are known to suffer from poor sound attenuation at depth, as well as poor resolution as depth increases. And all of these challenges combine to make ultrasound images difficult to segment, difficult to interpret. At the heart of this long list of uh, challenges is the fact that ultrasound images are generally considered to have poor quality in comparison to other imaging methods available in clinics today. So there have been several techniques over the history of the ultrasound imaging in the medical field to overcome challenges with poor image quality. For example, spatial compounding has been implemented to smooth out that granular appearance of the ultrasound images. Doppler imaging was introduced to image blood flow, which can potentially be extended to segment vessels of interest. We have harmonic imaging, which was introduced to reduce the acoustic clutter so that regions that should appear black actually appear black. However, there's a subset of patients where this technique does not always work. Then we have a method that I developed during my PhD, a coherence-based approach to imaging to reduce acoustic clutter, which works, in case, which works well in cases where harmonic imaging fails. As you can see in this example of the beating heart where there's a lot of clutter near the top of the left ventricle, and that clutter is reduced with the coherence-based approach to uh, beamforming the signals. And we also have a method that allows us to image the mechanical properties of tissue, as you can see here, where the uh, tumor is harder than the surrounding tissue, and so it shows up at a different, uh, with a different color. And this can also be extended to help with tumor segmentation. And then there are other methods as well that address some of the same challenges that these existing methods address. Despite these techniques to overcome the long list of challenges here, none of them simultaneously address all challenges. And so this is what leads me to explore deep learning as a potential solution to simultaneously address this long list of challenges in one step. So the question I'd like to answer is, uh, how, can we use a no how can we transform a noisy, poor contrast image like the one shown here and use it to display uh, structures that might not show up very well, such as a needle tip? We wanna, I want to provide a more clearer indication about where the needle tip is located, and I can do this by overlaying the needle tip on the image or displaying uh, the needle tip by itself. Another example is that I'd like to use a deep neural network to transform a noisy, poor contrast image like this into uh, an image that only shows my structure of interest, and then I can add the same network that allowed me, uh, then I can add the same network that allowed me to detect the needle tip on, uh, in the example from the previous slide, and this is the idea and the concept for using deep learning to segment only the structures of image of interest and then combine different networks and allow us to get multiple outputs with a single step. And so this concept is the topic of my recently funded Trailblazer Award from the NIH. At the time that I proposed this concept and received this award, no one was thinking in this direction, so the award is appropriately titled. Successful 
implementation of this proposed approach would offer significant improvements over the current state of the field and overcome many of the challenges with poor image quality in a single image formation step. And so how do we actually do this? Well, I assume you know a lot about uh, uh, deep learning. So for the next part of the talk, I'll go more into, um, into more detail about the beamforming process. So this is a standard ultrasound uh, system that's used in the clinic. The architecture is such that it contains three main components. The first is a scanner, which houses much of the electrical components of the system and also houses the computing um, hardware. Then we have a, a probe that's used to interface ultrasound images, uh, uh, that's used to be, uh, interface with the body and has a, an, a, range of, a range of different shapes and sizes depending on the body part being imaged. And then we have a monitor that's used to display the image on the screen. The way that these three components interact is, this, is that the scanner transmits electrical pulses to the ultrasound probe, which contains an array of piezoelectric elements that convert the electrical signals into mechanical pressure waves that are propagated into the body. These mechanical pressure waves then bounce off of, di bounce off of different structures in the body and create echoes that return to the probe that converts those same mechanical pressure waves into electrical signals with the piezoelectric elements housed in the probe. And those signals are then sent to the scanner, which receives the signals and sends them to an onboard computer for processing. The first step in the processing chain is beamforming. You can think of beamforming as the first line of software defense against a poor quality image. After beamforming, the signals undergo some more post-processing, such as scan conversion, log compression, and filtering. And finally, the image is ready for display on the monitor. So why exactly is beamforming needed? To answer this question, let's take a closer look at the ultrasound probe that's used to interface with the body. This probe contains an array of piezoelectric elements, as you see here. The goal of these uh, piezoelectric elements is to transmit the mechanical pressure waves into the body. And so what is the shape of the beam that's transmitted into the body? Ideally, we want it to look something like this, where it's infinitely narrow as uh, depth increases. But due to the physics of wave propagation, we instead get something that looks like this, where it starts off narrow, but then it increases as depth increases. And so beamforming is our attempt to give us something that looks more like the ideal beam shape at a, a specific focal depth. And so how do we go from beamforming to images? Well, here again, we have the probe interface with the body. And we use a mathematical formulation to focus the beam, as shown on the previous slide. And we focus the beam at different locations along the aperture. And then we receive the echoes and build up an image line by line. And so in this concept, we transmit light. I mean, we transmit sound. And we get the image. And we can receive the sound and uh, perform the same concept uh, to focus the energy of the received signals on the receiving end as well as the transmit end. So we have both transmit and receive beamforming. Now with uh, this ultrasound imaging method, it may be difficult to detect uh, needle tips for the range of challenges that I introduced earlier, which are relisted here, uh, such as poor sound attenuation with depth and the way that the beam shape grows with depth, causing poor resolution with depth. And so one of the um, solutions that I'm exploring to address this challenge with needle tip detection is to transmit light instead of sound. And this transmission of light is called photoacoustic imaging or PA imaging. And so how is photoacoustic imaging uh, related to ultrasound imaging? Well, we take the same hardware that's used for ultrasound imaging, as you see here, and we add a laser to it. And this combination is called a photoacoustic imaging system. And then if we want to image our needle tip, that becomes our target. And so the goal is to uh, the goal of the technique is to transmit light toward our target, which would absorb the light, undergo thermal expansion, and generate a sound wave that we detect with conventional ultrasound transducers. And then once this sound wave is detected, all of the signal processing is very much similar to that of ultrasound, where the piezoelectric elements convert the mechanical pressure waves that's sensed into an electrical signal that then sends it to the scanner, 
and the scanner sends it to an onboard computer for processing. And the first step in that processing chain is, again, the very critical beamforming step. And then the signals might undergo some more post-processing. And finally, the photoacoustic image is ready for display on the monitor. Now, the nice thing about photoacoustic imaging being ultrasound imaging with a laser is that we can interleave ultrasound and photoacoustic images to improve the clinical experience. So I can determine where my needle tip is located with the assistance of the laser, um, and I can use the ultrasound image to provide detail about the anatomical structure as I'm guiding the needle to a structure of interest. And so finally, the mathematical formulation of beamforming um, is displayed in this concept where we can consider, uh, for simplicity, an ultrasound or a photoacoustic source that's simply a point source as shown here. Now, the pressure waves that propagate toward the array of elements shown here uh, is sensed uh, by each element, and we see that there is a, uh, a phase shift of these signals that are sensed relative to each other. And so we apply time delays to each channel in order to line the signals up, and then we sum so that we get one signal that corresponds with the one source that created those multiple signals on the multiple channels. And so we apply this for each point along each scan line, where the distance is related to, um, or the time delay is related to the distance that that source or that location is from the, receive, uh, from the particular receiver. And so that's the concept of beamforming in the receive, or receive beamforming. And so let's put this all together with a simulation. We have a point source propagating outward spherically toward our transducer. The transducer senses the signal on each of its elements, and we get a recording that looks like this, which we call our channel data, our raw channel data. We want to beamform this channel data in order for it to look like the source that created the, these, this recording. So we would ideally like it to look like this. But when we apply today's beamformers, we don't get something like, that looks like this all the time. We might instead get something that looks like this, where we don't have a perfect circle, there's some distortion of the shape, the, sh the source does not appear at the correct depth, and there's some artifacts to the left and right of the source. And so the reason why this happens is because of a fundamental flaw in the beamforming process. Current beamformers make assumptions about the wave propagation that are not always true. So for example, we need to apply time delays to each channel. And we know from physics that the time that needs to be applied is related to the distance of the source from the receiver through the speed of sound. One assumption that we make is that the speed of sound is constant. However, in reality, the speed of sound is not constant. It can change for different tissues, or different tissues have different speeds of sound, and the bulk speed of sound of a, within one patient is different from the bulk speed of sound in another patient. And so artifacts are produced when the acoustic environment significantly deviates from the assumptions that we make during the beamforming process. And this includes assumptions not only about the speed of sound, but also assumptions about there being constant density, or assumptions that there is a single path from the source to the receiver, when in actuality, there could be multipath reverberations or there could be reflections. So let's take another look at what happens when we actually have a reflector in the field. So we have a single source and now something that reflects that source. The source propagates outward spherically, and when it encounters a reflection, it's very faint, but another uh, wavefront is produced. And when we make a recording, what, what we get is the uh, channel data that you see on the right. And when we beamform this channel data, the beamform the signals in the red box, we get this image in the larger red box. And what you can see from this image is that although we know from our simulation that there was only one source, uh, we get a recording that looks as if there are two wavefronts, and then when we beamform that, we see a, a source and an artifact in the image. Now this is the case for photoacoustic imaging or ultrasound imaging of a single point source. But when we make ultrasound images of tissue, our wave field looks very different. However, the same concept exists in that if you think of the, the tissue as containing multiple point sources, those point sources are superimposed on each other, and that's uh, what you get in the image on the top in the blue box. But then when you have reflections, say, from the ribs, you get additional wave fronts that are superimposed on the wave fronts from the pure tissue. And so we can think of artifacts as the mapping of signal sources to the wrong location. 
And this is the underlying reason for why uh, my lab is exploring a deep learning approach to beamforming. With this approach, our goal is to map the signal sources to the correct location. And a cartoon of the concept is shown here, where we want to start with our raw channel data, pass it through a well-trained network, and classify each wavefront that's detected as a source or an artifact. And then we want to reformat the sources and artifacts classification into an interpretable image. And how do we do our training? Well, we train with simulations much like the ones that you saw in the previous slides. These simulations are intended to mimic the physics of wave propagation. And it, they can be done for both ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. And what exactly are we learning? Well, I started in this direction because you will notice from the simulations that sources that are closer to the receiver will have a different wave, sh wave front shape than sources that are farther away. And so what I believe uh, we are learning, at least with the photoacoustic example, is that unique shape to depth relationship. And it uh, remains an open question as to what the networks are interpreting when applied to ultrasound imaging. So let's uh, put this all together with a, a real clinical example, the case of ultrasound-guided biopsy, where a small tissue is removed for examination under a microscope, and ultrasound is used to guide the needle to the target of interest. And so one question we might want to know is, where is our needle tip? In some patients, it's very clear to see where the needle tip is located. In others, not so much, even though the same equipment and the same beamforming methods are being implemented. So wouldn't it be nice if we could know with confidence for all patients exactly where that needle tip is located as shown here? And we can do this with photoacoustic imaging by inserting an optical fiber in the core of the biopsy needle, and that allows us to generate a photoacoustic source at the needle tip. And so here's an example of the photoacoustic image that would be produced with this concept. And then it doesn't stop there. Because the image contains a lot of artifacts, we still need to apply segmentation to this image in order to localize the needle tip. And so one other point to consider is that this now becomes the task of a clinician finding a tiny source within the body. And so we can alleviate that task for the clinician and free the hands of the operator by attaching the ultrasound probe to a robot and asking the robot to search for that signal. And we've tested this concept in my lab, and this is a, a picture of the setup, where we have an optical fiber inserted into a needle, and that needle and optical fiber setup is connected to a translation stage, which allows us to control the insertion of the needle into ex vivo uh, liver tissue. And then we have an ultrasound probe viewing the tip of the needle and attached to a robot arm. So let's look, a, look at a video of this system in action, which was published recently in Scientific Reports. So here, the needle is inserted into the, and advanced into the tissue, and we can see that the ultrasound probe follows the needle tip. And so it's making subtle motions to stay centered on the needle tip. And then we can override the robot's motion to find our biopsy target, and then release, and the robot is able to recover the needle tip position again. And then if we transition to a view of what we see on the screen, we see the photoacoustic image. It's very difficult for the segmentation algorithm to find the signal because initially there's poor SNR, but the robot continues searching until it finds the signal and then confidently centers the ultrasound probe on the needle tip. And so from this video, we can appreciate that artifacts are problematic, not just for us as humans interpreting the image, but also for robots. And so this provides additional motivation for a deep learning approach to image formation. And so with this motivation, unfortunately, deep learning is not an exact science, so it did require some trial and error. And so several networks were tested to implement this concept. And the one that we settled on and published uh, last year is the um, Faster RCNN network published in IEEE Transactions on Medical Imaging. And a cartoon of the network architecture is shown here, where we input our raw channel data sensed by the network, uh, sensed by the ultrasound transducer in simulation first to train the network. And our outputs, we have three outputs of interest. 
The first is a classification of the detected wavefront as a source or an artifact. The second is a bounding box location that tells us where the artifact is, or the source detected is located. And the third is a confidence score about the detection. And so we can also vary multiple parameters when training and testing our network. And here's an example of one of the parameters that's very relevant that was varied uh, first in simulation, and that's noise. So we start with a perfectly noiseless system, and then we add increasing levels of channel noise to the channel data. And here is an example result showing how the network performs for these multiple levels of channel noise. What we see is that uh, for no, the noiseless case and for low levels of noise, the network has a perfect accuracy with detecting both sources and artifacts, which are shown in shades of blue. The accuracy with detecting sources and artifacts are shown in shades of blue. And then as we get down to about negative 15 dB channel noise, it becomes uh, increasingly difficult for the network to maintain its accuracy. But what's remarkable about this result is that at 15 dB um, source accuracy, or at 15 dB channel noise, the accuracy is above 80%. And if you look at the image at 15 dB channel noise, it's very difficult for you and I to detect where that wavefront is located. And so as the channel noise increases, the accuracy with which we can detect sources and artifacts plummets, and we start to see more missed sources and more missed artifacts, which are shown in shades of yellow. And this same concept is um, displayed in the ROC curves for the source on the top and the artifact on the bottom where we have perfect detection in the noiseless and the minimal noise cases, and that detection degrades as the noise level increases. Another metric of interest is the location accuracy. How well can we determine where the uh, peak of the wavefront is located? And so what we see here is that we can measure this accuracy in the two image dimensions, in the axial dimension, which corresponds to the depth dimension, and in the lateral dimension, which corresponds to the direction of the arrays along the transducer. And ultimately, the take home message is that for multiple levels of channel noise, our accuracy is a sub-millimeter. It's about 0.1 millimeter in the axial dimension and 0.2 millimeters in the lateral dimension. And this is a remarkable result, because if you consider the resolution of the imaging system, we're actually getting better resolution than the resolution provided with the beamforming methods uh, alone. And this is true at a range of noise levels as well as a range of depths. So this is very promising for the technique. I've shown you how we can vary noise, and there, were other, there are a host of other um, parameters that can be varied, um, which are listed here as an example, but I won't show those results in the interest of time. So we can vary, for example, the number of sources and artifacts, the speed of sound, as well as our ultrasound receiver model. And then once we have this well-trained network with all of these parameters varied, we can then transfer it to experimental data. And so here is a setup that we used to test our network on experimental data, where we have a phantom containing these brachytherapy seeds that look like point sources in this uh, view of the ultrasound uh, probe. And then we can selectively illuminate which sources show up in the image by uh, pointing optical fibers at the sources. And so, for example, this photograph shows us selectively illuminating two sources, and this image on the right shows us what happens when we selectively illuminate three sources, the image on the left. And if we take a closer look at this image, what we see is that although we know that we selectively illuminated only three sources, we get four wavefronts in this experimental image. And when we beamform this image, we get something that looks like this, which looks as if there are four point targets, or four breaking therapy seeds in the image, but because we selectively illuminated three seeds, we know that only three should show up. However, the clinician relying on this image might not know that. And in fact, this could be very detrimental because these breaking therapy seeds are actually used to treat prostate cancer. And so it's very critical to get the location and the pattern of these seeds correct. And so what we want to do to help with that is to return to the raw data that created this image, replace the mathematical component of the image formation 
with the deep neural network that was trained to detect sources and reformat the outputs of the network into a usable image. And this image is an image that we call our CNN-based image, and it has no artifacts simply because we choose not to display them. It has arbitrarily high contrast because we choose the amplitude with which we want to display the detected sources. And it has high resolution at depth because the size with which we display the sources is related to the location accuracy measurements that we took when training and testing the network. And this is true uh, for, and the accuracy persists down to depths as large as eight centimeters as shown on this slide, where this time, this is an in vivo example that also was not included during training. And the setup is a little different in that we are navigating a cardiac catheter toward the heart and an optical fiber is inserted into the cardiac catheter. Uh, the goal is to illuminate the tip of the cardiac catheter much like we wanted to see the needle tip. And so um, with the traditional beamforming methods, as we are um, moving this catheter back and forth, this is what uh, the image on the right shows what we get with today's beamforming method at such a deep depth. The resolution is very poor. And so our goal is to return to the channel data that created that image and bypass it through our network to determine exactly where the catheter tip is located, as you see here. And then we can also overlay the uh, detected, the CNN-based image on the traditional image to determine exactly where that catheter tip is located in the photoacoustic image. And so this is very promising for the technology, and it's, it's the, these Initial results are what led us to explore the possibility of applying similar approaches to ultrasound data. And so if we, t if we return back to the same clinical challenge of performing an ultrasound guided biopsy and instead ask ourselves, now where is that biopsy target? We can also appreciate that we can still attach the ultrasound probe to a robot and allow the robot to search for both the biopsy target and the needle but you can imagine that it needs both a, a good ultrasound and photoacoustic images in order to do this task. And it also needs to have real-time feedback of the ultrasound images and to be update, that feedback needs to be updated as fast as possible. For this reason, we choose one of the fastest methods available for performing ultrasound images, which is plane wave imaging. And in plane wave imaging, it requires the use of unfocused transmissions on all transmit elements with no delays. So as a reminder, for focused images, we focus our a group of elements into the body one at a time, and we receive the wavefront with each focused beam. With uh, unfocused or plane wave imaging, we just transmit on all elements at once. And the trade-off is that this provides poor image quality, but it provides really fast frame rates. And so here's an example of um, the raw channel data received from a single plane wave transmission. And we only use a single plane wave because we want to get the fastest, or we want to explore what's possible with the fastest frame rates that we can achieve. And so we only use a single plane wave transmission. And then if we beamform this image, it's a poor quality image. And if we segment it, we don't get the greatest segmentation. And so our goal is to take that same raw channel data and pass it through a trained network and achieve the ideal segmentation of that target. And so just like we trained our photoacoustic examples with uh, um, simulations, we can train our ultrasound um, networks with simulations as well. And here, our simulation training is such that we have a single cyst in tissue uh, we uh, train with anechoic, meaning that this cyst should return no echoes. So any echoes that are seen in the beamformed image is due to acoustic clutter. And then we train with a hypoechoic cyst, which is a low contrast, or which, which is a low contrast cyst that has amplitudes within the cyst that are slightly lower than the surrounding tissue. And then again, we just use a single plane wave, and we vary the multiple simulation parameters, such as the cyst radius between these values shown here the speed of sound of the medium, and the axial and lateral location of the cyst. And then in testing, we can create a completely new data set that was um, randomly drawn from the multiple um, simulation parameters that were included during training, as well as having an um, amplitude uh, that ranges from anechoic to negative 6 dB. 
And so here's an example of a result from the test set that was not included during training. So this is our ground truth that we provide to the simulator, which gives us a raw channel data that looks like this. And then when we, when we apply beamforming, we get um, an image that looks like this, which you can see contains a, a clutter within the region that should be anechoic. Our goal then is to pass the raw channel, channel data to the network that was trained in, uh, with the previous simulation um, sets, test uh, training sets, and get a CNN-based image that more clearly displays the structure of interest. And we know what that structure should be because we simulated it. And so we can compare our ground truth to the output of the network. And when we do that for this example, we get a dice similarity coefficient that's fairly high. And we can look at our dice similarity coefficients over the range of parameters that were tested, which we actually did in these publications shown here. And I'm just going to focus on cyst radius because it was the most interesting and it showed the most interesting uh, trends. And that trend is that uh, we could see that if we look at, we uh, appreciate that the x-axis shows a cyst radius and the y-axis shows the measured uh, dice similarity coefficient, and the red dots show the dice similarity for every cyst that was included during testing, and the blue line aggregates the results uh, by rounding to the nearest uh, integer multiple of the cyst radius, just to help us visualize that more clearly. And what we see is basically that the um, dice similarity coefficient degrades as the cyst gets smaller and smaller. And then when we transfer the trained network that was trained only with simulations to experimental phantom data, we see that for the phantoms that contain cyst sizes that are um, within the range of the simulated cyst sizes, we get a similar performance to what we get with the simulation test set. And so let's take a closer look as to what's happening with these smaller cysts. And so this apparent degradation in the dice similarity coefficient is actually due to the coefficient measuring or penalizing uh, errors in smaller cysts more than errors in larger cysts. And so if we consider that our segmented image is shown here and the true segmentation is shown in red overlaid on this image, we can see that the dice similarity coefficient is, is quite low, but the cyst size and shape are generally consistent with the ground truth. And so what this indicates is that it's very important for us as a community to choose appropriate um, metrics when we're evaluating the performance of our network. Because if our goal were to learn the number of cysts with a specific size, this network uh, would actually perform very well. But that is not our goal in this case, so we set out to explore how we can further improve the dice similarity coefficients of these smaller cysts. And so this is what led us to think about including more features um, when training our network. And here, uh, this is what led us to explore a generative adversarial network. And so with this network, the more features that we want to include is learning not only the segmentation, but also the B mode image. So we have essentially two outputs with a single input. And if we take a step back and look at what this network structure says, it tells us that we can actually combine uh, both image formation and image segmentation in a single step. And so this is what led me to think of more broadly about how can we as a community build these networks that take a single input and produce multiple outputs, because ultimately those multiple outputs are all based on the same raw data. And so this is the structure of our network in a little bit more detail. We have our RF channel data. We have a generator that produces both the uh, DNN image and the DNN segmentation. And then we have a discriminator. Uh, the goal of the generator is to trick the discriminator into thinking that the images are real. And then we have the, um, we combine the uh, DNN image and the DNN segmentation, along with the RF channel data that uh, creates the, the images into a single stack that we call the DNN stack. And that DNN stack is what's fed into our discriminator. And during training, we have a beamform stack, which essentially contains the same raw data. It contains the, uh, the true beam, the beamformed image from that raw data and it contains the ground truth segmentation that is included during training only. And 
the goal of the discriminator is to determine if the, the DNN stack or the prediction, it predicts whether the output from the neural network is real or fake. And as a reminder, this beamform stack is only included during training of the discriminator. And so one other point to consider as a community is that as we're building these networks, although currently there is no, um, there's a lot of trial and error, I'd like to see us move more toward understanding what the networks are doing and understanding whether the components and the modules that we are adding are actually necessary and how does that affect our evaluation metrics that we define based on the task of the network. And so to do this for this particular network, we realize that we can have two possible generators. One is that we can have a single encoder decoder structure that would enable us to share features among the two outputs. Or we can have two encoders and decoders that uh, one is trained to produce only a DNN image and does not share features with the other one that's trained to produce the DNN segmentation. And then we can also ask ourselves whether the discriminator is necessary. And so this allows us to have a total of four networks, two with discriminator, two without, two with a single encoder decoder, so it has feature sharing, and two that does not have feature sharing. And so this is a quantitative summary of our performance. What we see are three insights from this systematic study. The first is that uh, if we look at the networks with the discriminator, the discriminator improves the segmentation of the small cyst, which is what we set out to do. So it indicates to us that it was helpful. The second point to note is that feature sharing improves our PSNR. And um, this leads us to conclude that the network with both the discriminator and the feature sharing is the most ideal. And so if we return back to this plot and just strip it away, uh, strip away all of the other uh, information except the information um, that aggregates the results by integer multiple of the radius. And we compare this result that we had previously to the result that we get with our GAN approach, we see that we achieved our goal of slightly increasing uh, the dice similarity coefficient that we see for the smaller cis. So we consider that a success and if we see some examples of what uh, this network actually looked like, so not just looking at quantitative summaries, uh, here are some actual examples. This is our raw data. This is what we get when we beamform the image with the delay and sum beamforming. And what you see that just showed up are the two outputs of the GAN. And we can compare the beamformed image to the output of the GAN and the input segmentation that was, or the ground truth segmentation, I should say, to the um, output of the GAN, the DNN segmentation output of the GAN. And what we see is that we have a fairly high PSNR as well as a fairly high DSD. And this is our simulation result. And when we look at our experimental result, so this is the experimental phantom, that was the little green dot on all of the curves that you saw previously throughout this section, we see, uh, in comparison, uh, we qualitatively get something that looks like the delay in some image and something that looks like the ground truth segmentation, although the results are both visibly and quantitatively lower. And then, um, despite the, um, well, just keep in mind that these are just preliminary results that do provide confidence for us to explore this pr approach further. And we are very excited by these results, as well as, uh, so these results were published earlier this year. And since then, we've had some newer modifications to our network that produce results that look like this, which are also equally exciting. And they're exciting because it indicates to us that now we can have three outputs from a single input. The first is that we can produce the ultrasound image as is. The second is that we can produce a smoother version of the ultrasound imaging, of the ultrasound image, which is uh, similar to what the spatial compounding introduction to improve image quality has done over the years of the ultrasound imaging history. And we can provide a segmentation. So we have three in one, three outputs from one input. And so um, although I've shown you how we can learn um, uh, segmentation, the outputs of the network are not just limited to segmentations or images. There is a list of other um, 
outputs that we can learn and that have been learned over the years, where the colors on this plot indicate the years, the short uh, three-year history, two to three-year history of this field. And the um, x-axis shows the number of publications that have actually learned these different outputs from the raw input as data. And the list on the left indicates the different outputs. The list on the right indicates the different outputs. No, you're left. <laughs> Um, so the different outputs are uh, high quality raw data, uh, compressed raw data. We can take raw data as input and learn a segmentation map as we're doing. We can also take uh, raw data as input and learn the speed of sound map, as well as high quality ultrasound images. We can learn elasticity images, and we can learn both the segmentation map and a B-mode image. And I'm pleased to see that Many of my colleagues around the world are implementing these different approaches, and so I just think that there's a lot of promise for the field, and I'd like to encourage us to continue thinking in this direction. And the, where our work fits in is here and here, where we are exploring how we can learn a segmentation map from the raw data. And our work and our approach is different from those shown here because we take the, single, uh, we take the raw data from a single plane wave transmit we do not apply any time delays, and our goal is to turn that into an interpretable, usable image in the format of a segmentation. As far as I'm aware, our group is also the first, or the, the only ones, as far as I'm aware, and the first to think about combining multiple outputs, or producing multiple outputs from a single input. So this graphic alone, uh, provides the evidence, I believe, to say that we are entering a new age of ultrasound image formation, and it's very exciting, and I believe that there's a lot of possibilities to explore. I believe it's such a young field, and there's a lot of different directions that can be taken. And so my outlook is that uh, we still are suffering from many of the classical challenges uh, with uh, deep learning, in that we uh, require training sets that include multiple possible patient variations, we um, need to think about generalizability for the specific tasks that I'm interested in. Uh, we want to learn circular cysts, but of course, all targets in the body are not circular, so we want to be able to generalize our networks to other structures. Um, uh, I think network interpretability, I know there's a group of us in, within this community that's working on this very topic, and I believe that this is very important even for the field of medical imaging with deep learning. And I also want to drive home the point that our evaluation metrics should very much be tied to the specific imaging tasks, and we shouldn't just draw from the same evaluation metrics that the general like, vi computer vision community uses. We should think about additional metrics that are useful for our community. And then I believe that this work just shows promise that we can get multiple outputs from a single input with feature sharing that's not just limited to ultrasound imaging, but could, could potentially be applied to other forms of medical imaging as well. Because other, image, other medical imaging techniques can provide multiple outputs, or, and do provide multiple outputs from the, single, from the same raw data that's measured by the like, MRI or CT scanner. So I encourage us to think in that direction as well. And if we think about the list that I showed earlier as a roadmap of major advances in ultrasound imaging, where I discussed that we had uh, spatial compounding, harmonic imaging, elasticity imaging, coherence-based imaging, and Doppler imaging, I believe that deep learning, a deep learning approach to beam forming and image formation will be one of the next major advances within this field. And so as a summary, um, with advances provided by deep learning, both ultrasound and photoacoustic images can be presented in a novel format that extracts information directly from the raw channel data. I've shown that we can have a one-step approach to address historical challenges with image quality, so no longer just a one, a one uh, approach for one challenge. We can address a, the long list of challenges with a single deep neural network is my vision. And so I've shown in this talk how we can address the challenges of reflection artifacts, segmentation, speckle, and clutter with a single network, potentially. And there are also others that can be addressed as well. And our initial results and those of my colleagues around the world uh, highlight the capabilities of deep learning for both ultrasound and photoacoustic image formation. And I believe that there are a lot of exciting possibilities ahead. And the results that I show are promising not just for us as humans 
reading the images, but also for robots uh, to perform more autonomous imaging tasks, such as autonomous surgery. And so as a broader overview of what my lab does, we take theories, models, and we develop theories and use models and simulations like the one shown here to design beamformers for both ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. We also design imaging probes, such as this specialized light delivery system shown here. And our goal is to uh, build and test prototypes with these designs that will ultimately improve image quality. And then we incorporate these designs and combine them with commercially available systems like the ultrasound system, the robot, or the laser shown here. And together, it creates a new system that's the first of its kind to address a clinical challenge. And then we take that system and test, the, test it on patients treated at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And then we might learn something from our clinical studies that would require us to revisit our theories, models, and simulations and the cycle would continue from there. And then I have two announcements. The first is that my lab is hiring postdocs in this area, so if you're interested, please do come and speak to me or reach out to me via email. And then second is that I'm guest editing a special issue in one of the most highly regarded ultrasound journals in our field. And I encourage anyone working in this field to submit their work to this journal and this special issue of the journal, Deep Learning in Medical Ultrasound. And I would be remiss to end this talk without uh, thanking my large team for making this work possible and my funding sources. And finally, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you for the talk. Uh, we have time for questions. It's hard to see from here, uh, but don't be shy. Okay. Well. Yes. Yeah, so there's a question there. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, so uh, since we, uh, it, it's, uh, I agree that it's really important in, to use uh, deep learning in ultrasound. And uh, since we started the talk about uh, how uh, dynamic focusing or beamforming is uh, fundamentally having a flaw about uh, assumptions in speed of sound, uh, uh, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's more interesting to see if, uh, if by, by using delay in sum and then using generating a data set of, out of this, uh, using this delay in sum and then doing the segmentation and comparing it with doing it directly from the raw data because then we will know if this assumption is really uh, dragging us behind if, uh, from doing actual segmentation. Maybe you uh, uh, can shed some light on that. Yeah, so my thoughts on that are that, um, so I approach this problem because prior to um, entering this field, my background and expertise is ultrasound imaging. And as part of my PhD, I spent a great deal of time understanding the sources of image quality degradation in ultrasound images. So there's a great body of research that already indicates that the speed of sound errors that we see is one of the major sources of ultrasound image de degradation. So we already know that in terms of image quality. And image quality is what drives segmentation. If we have a poor image quality, we're going to have a poor segmentation. Um, there's no way to get around that. So those are my thoughts on that topic. Thanks a lot. Thanks. I think there's a question on the, on the upper left there. Thank you for a great talk. Um, when you use your setup at the highest resolution at this moment, could you elaborate on what is the computational uh, performance you need in terms of like operations per second on the device that is processing these images in real time? Yeah, that's a good question. So you mean like when we, when we put our raw data into the network and output the image, do the, the images provide real time 
uh, essentially the equivalent of what we would get with real-time frame rates? Yes. And the answer is yes, they do. So for example, for our photoacoustic images, we were able to get frame rates in the, on the order of 14 frames per second, which is great for the setup that we have because our laser only fires at 10 hertz. So we're actually able to update faster than our laser can fire. And similar performance is achieved for the ultrasound networks as well, although I don't remember the frame rates off the top of my head, but they are available within our publications. And can you comment on what hardware are you using to compute? Oh, um, we use a range of GPUs from NVIDIA. So we have a Titan Black uh, GPU. We have a Titan XP GPU as well. So though, that's what drives the, the learning and the output of our networks. Thank you. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, can you comment on extending this to either fetal or cardiac? Yeah, that's a good question because I just showed cysts, right? Because our, our approach is like these interventional techniques that were, you know, would use biopsies. But there's nothing really unique about the fact that we're training cysts in the sense that if uh, we are interested instead with, a, uh, we're interested instead in fetal or cardiac imaging, then to me that would just indicate that we would just need to change our simulations to train with models that mimic the cardiac structure or the fetal structure. And I believe that we should be able to achieve similar benefits in, a, after making that modification. Okay, thank you. So there's a question at the front there on the left. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I see that you have some continuous outcome variables like uh, location and radius. I wonder how, uh, if you have any advice on regression networks versus classification networks, i.e. the uh, regression head or classification layer uh, for those variables. Um, say that again, please. I didn't hear the full question, so maybe could you try so speaking louder? I see that you have uh, continuous variables like location and radius uh, being predicted by the networks. I wonder if you have an advice for the technical audience about the regression, about regression networks versus classification networks. That means um, having regression heads to predict those variables versus oh, classification. Oh, okay, networks. yeah, so those, th that can be used as well. And in fact, in that uh, group of papers that I cited, there are some that are using those kind of networks instead, and they're able to achieve a different type of image, but it's an image that meets their criteria for what they want to learn. So it's certainly possible, and others are also doing it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. We have a question here at the front. Uh, Barry, just, just here. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. And if we read the textbook of, of ultrasound imaging, there are so many equations. That is the physical equations. And in the beam forming, using a deep learning. So what kind of physical models are created? So you know, if you read the textbook, side lobes and you know, beam focusing, so many things. The Fraunhofer zones and the other it is right. So what kind of physical models are created by using a deep learning? So, yeah, that's a great question. So what, I, what, what, we're, what we're doing is we're not um, saying, we're not, we don't want to throw away the physics, but we incorporate all of the physical models that have already been in, uh, created and used to make ultrasound simulations. So to answer the question as to what physical models are we using, we're using the same physical models that the simulations are based on. And our goal is then to learn and extract only the structures that we care about from the simulations that, are, are, that create data that are based and rooted in the physics. Thanks. If there's a last burning question. Uh, yes, yeah, so there. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, for the physical models, I think you have guarantees, but how would you trade the offset you get from the bias by learning from data? compared to the error in the models? 
Um, so how to create, how to I account mean, for an offset bias. In, so the only bias would be if the uh, model that the simulation, well, I would say the primary, not the only, but the primary uh, bias would be the error of if, or if the physics that the simulator is based on does not incorporate all of the possible acoustic uh, wave uh, propagation variables based on physics. And so that, I believe, would be one of the primary sources of error with our approach. And then there could be a, just additional sources because the network hasn't quite learned the uh, physical models as it should. And so um, I guess currently the field accounts for that second source of error by including more training data. And so I would suggest to include more training data to account for that error and to account for the first error we would just need better simulators so that we are accurately simulating the physics of wave propagation or at least simulating to a first order uh, effect where we are able to produce images that provide enough information for us to trust and for that error to be low, the out for us to trust the output of the network and for that error to be sufficiently low for us to achieve our desired task. Because all of this is task based. Like what might work for one task might not necessarily work for another task. So the goal is to have our, mo our models and our um, simulators be good enough to achieve whatever that specific task, but it's important for us to define what that task is from the beginning. OK, thanks. Oh. Thanks. So I think that um, having the take-off message of, of really understanding the task we're trying to solve and, and really understanding the physics of, of image acquisition to feed that into our, our work uh, is a great one to finish. Uh, so let's thank the speaker. Thanks. So we'll directly go on to the next scientific session. So I'll just call the session chairs uh, to uh, come here. So Eugenio and Mary, I think. Hello? <laughs> it works. Okay, it works. Um, we are ready, please. No, it doesn't work. No, no. Hello? Hello? Okay. So, hello everyone. My name is Maritel Bacuadra. And I'm very pleased to chair this session with uh, Juan Ig uh, Eugenio Iglesias. And this is the session on adversarial training. And the first topic will be on learning uh, with multitask adversaries using weekly labeled data for seg semantic segmentation in retinal images. Uh, hi, I'm Oindrila, and I'll be presenting my paper on uh, learning with multitask adversaries using weekly labeled data for semantic segmentation in retinal images. So um, our main aim in this uh, work is that given a retinal fundus image, we should, uh, we should be able to uh, 
segment out all the uh, pathologies and anatomies of the retinal image using a single segmentation network in an end-to-end manner. So the main challenge in this task is that uh, we have a lot of data sets that uh, uh, together they have all the classes annotated, but no one data set has all the uh, classes, that is all the anatomies and all the pathologies annotated. So uh, to form an end-to-end network which will be able to segment all of these uh, six, seven classes, which are the retinal vessels, the optic disc, and the diseases, we need to use more than one data set to train our uh, segmentation network. So this is the context of the weekly label data that I'm talking about. So prior art in this uh, field is that, uh, f uh, like, for segmenting out all of the all of these uh, six classes, there is, there is a classical method that is it goes uh, in a step by step manner. So first it will segment out the high intensity uh, diseases, then it will go to the dark lesions, and then uh, segment out the optic disc uh, and so on. So it's a, it's not an end to end method. And uh, in deep learning based methods, there is uh, no single method that has. Uh, uh, that has segmented out all of these classes in, uh, in using just one segmentation network. So the first, uh, the first paper, it, uh, it uses the CNN for segmenting out the retinal vessels. It was uh, published in 2016, and then we have uh, uh, the next paper, which segments out the lesions, the diseases, and the next paper, they use a CNN and a, a conditional random field to segment out the retinal vessels. So none of these, pap none of these papers who have used uh, deep learning based methods have formed one single uh, method to segment out uh, all of vessels, optic discs, and the diseases. So the solution that we propose is that uh, for our use case, we have uh, trained using uh, two data sets. One is the drive data set and the other is the uh, IDRID. So the drive data set has only the vessels marked and the IDRID has the optic disc and four diseases marked. So we train our segmentation network using, uh, using an image from any one of the data sets and we uh, transfer between these data sets uh, after every epoch to uh, train our segmentation network. So we get C, uh, we, uh, we have C classes, and we get C uh, ch channels in, in our segmented maps. We do a channel shuffling, which I'll be talking about later, and the motive behind it. And uh, so uh, we remove our background from, this, uh, from these segmented maps for all further computations. Uh, I'll be talking about why we do that. So our first discriminator, which is the novelty in our technique, is uh, the, the discriminator one, which tells me whether a class is present in the image or not. For example, uh, drive data set has optic disk present, but it's not annotated in it. So my discriminator one, irrespective of the annotations, will tell me that uh, drive data set has optic disk present. So this is helping me to learn from uh, another data set, the, uh, uh, learn a class from another data set for the data set where that uh, class is not annotated. So uh, the next discriminator uh, that we have, it uses the, it, it masks the segmented maps with respect to what, uh, with respect to the ground truth we have. That is, we and uh, we uh, mask those channels which we do not have annotated in a respect in, in in my respective data set, and then we do a shuffling and uh, feed it to the discriminator two, which is uh, which is the traditional discriminator. That is, it's the real versus fake discriminator. It tells me whether the input is, uh, like it discriminates whether uh, it's manual uh, or synthetic. So my discriminator one outputs a, a, a one hot, a six length one hot vector N1. So here we have six classes, which are two uh, anatomies and four diseases. So it will, uh, it will, it should output one if that uh, class is present in the data set, irrespective of the annotations that I have. So uh, for this, uh, the uh, first clause that we use for the segmentation network 
is given an image, uh, we find the uh, BCE loss. So my Y hat here is the, uh, uh, is the segmented maps that I'm getting from the segmentation network. And Y is the ground truth that I have. So I, f I find the BCE for all those channels where my ground truth isn't uh, null. So uh, for example, like in drive, I don't have the uh, optic disk marked. So I want to calculate the loss uh, for the class of optic disk. So this loss is then back propagated through the segmentation network. So, uh, so the moral behind, um, the motive behind channel shuffling is that, uh, like I said, uh, in the discriminator one, we are uh, saying that that discriminator is telling me whether a class is present or not, irrespective of the annotations. So if I don't uh, shuffle my uh, segmented maps, the, uh, the discriminator one will learn uh, with respect to the data set, whether, uh, like, the, uh, will learn the N1 uh, one hot vector with respect to the data set and not with respect to the segmented maps that I'm uh, giving as input. So I want my discriminator one to, see, uh, to look at the segmented maps that I'm giving and not the annotations to tell me whether uh, my segmentation looks as if it's uh, present in the uh, image. So it's just a, a description how, uh, like, before shuffling and after shuffling. And I concatenate my input image with the segmented maps. So, so like I said, this, uh, we have uh, N1, uh, one hot vector. And we find uh, binary decross entropy loss for N1 and N1 hat. And that is back propagated through the discriminator one. And the discriminator two, which is the, um, which is the traditional manual versus synthetic uh, discriminator, it, has, uh, it gives us output a uh, two length, one hot vector. Uh, so I'm shuffling the ground truth and the segmented maps. So it's just telling me, like, one is for manual and zero is for synthetic. So it's just discriminating between the two. So another thing that we do is we remove the background class from the, uh, after we get the segmented maps from our segmentation network, we remove the background class. That is, uh, it's so because uh, if, like, the background is different for both of the data sets. Like for drive, as we don't, do not have the optic disk, uh, optic disk will be counted as the background. And for IDRID, because we don't have the vessels, the vessels go, uh, go into background pixels. So uh, we remove the background and we do all further computations uh, and also the binary cross entropy loss after removing uh, the background. So we... Uh, we backpropagate both of these uh, discriminator losses. We add both of these losses and backpropagate it through our segmentation network. So these are some of the results. So uh, this is the images, uh, input fundus images that we have, and this is the ground truth that we have. So um, the ground truth is like for drive, we have the vessels, the, so that's what's shown here. And for IDRID, we have the optic disk and the diseases. And this is the prediction that we get. Also, we get the uh, prediction for the non-annotated classes. Like uh, for drive, we do not have the optic disk annotated. So, but still, using our network, we are getting the optic disk um, channel as, uh, as, a, as a class. And similarly, for IDRID, I'm getting the vessels. So we compared our, uh, our evaluation of the uh, optic disk and the diseases with the IDRID leaderboard. So we, uh, so, uh, we perform quite close to what, uh, what results are there, uh, even though, like, even though our, our method is uh, segmenting out all of the classes and not, and not just a specific uh, segmentation network for optic disk collisions. So for vessel segmentation, uh, these are some of the results where we have the fundus image, the ground truth, and the prediction. And uh, I'd like to compare it with a technique that was uh, uh, like published in 2016, uh, which was deep vessel. So what we see is that uh, our method does not, like it does not uh, do the error of uh, 
uh, of segmenting out the optic disc boundary as a vessel. So I think that is because uh, we have uh, like we have six classes and optic disc is one of the classes. So we uh, we also reduce false positives because we are se segmenting out all different classes together. So we compare our method to uh, some vessel segmentation techniques. So mostly, uh, like our method is performed better than many of the techniques that I went through, and uh, except one which was in uh, which was Meninis et al. So uh, the takeaway is that our method is performing uh, very close to uh, uh, close to these uh, other seg other state of the art segmentation networks. Uh, despite the fact that our uh, that our uh, segmentation network is solving more than one problem, it is solving all of the it's segmenting out all of the classes together. So okay, so um, so in the, in this uh, prediction for non-annotated classes, we did not have the annotation for vessels for IDRID or for optic disk for drive but so we could not compare the quantitative results for each of these classes so we did a inference only experiment for, uh, like for uh, vessels we used the hrf data set and we used our trained model and did a inference for the images of the hrf data set and it performed better than the initial uh, vessel segmentation uh, Technique that these uh, that the people who had published the data set had uh, uh, proposed, but it, it's uh, like uh, we compared it to the uh, recent state of the art, so it's it's really uh, it's uh, performing near to tho those as well. So uh, we also did uh, uh, did for the uh, hard exudates, which are these uh, high intensity pixels, on the E of the data set. And we did for the optic disk, which is from the refuge uh, challenge data set, and we compared it with the refuge leaderboard. So the take home message is that existing methods, uh, they rely on uh, pre and post processing techniques a lot, and it, no uh, previous technique has done an end to end solution without the need for uh, manual feature extraction. And our method is providing a single solution for all anatomy and pathology segmentation. Also, uh, the main takeaway is that our multitask model uh, predicts classes that were originally not annotated in a given data set by learning from other data sets. Thank you. The talk is open for questions. Hi, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, there are other teams that have tried to solve the multitasking uh, segmentation problem when you have an unbalanced uh, set of uh, uh, segmentation. So you have segmentation for class A and segmentation for class B, like in your case. And they have done it in a simple way just by backpropagating gradients of only the classes for which you have annotations. So it's a much more simple method than what you present. Did you consider to use that as a baseline to compare with your gun based method? So, uh, like in uh, adversarial networks, like my discriminator is just helping me learn better. So, both of my discriminators is first, uh, the second discriminator is helping me learn, uh, like, uh, it's uh, helping me increase the accuracy of a single class. And the other discriminator is helping me generalize. So, I can do this, I can do this using just one segmentation network too. But uh, these two discriminators are helping me uh, solve this problem better. How much did they help uh, with respect to not using discriminators and just propagating uh, gradients? Yeah, from? we did. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, we compared to. Uh, we compared to. The, you can check my paper. We can. We compared it to just using the segmentation network and uh, uh, like we saw it was performing better. Okay. Thank you. More questions from the audience? I can maybe in the meantime ask one. I, uh, you are actually relying on the fact that you have multiple data sets, and I was wondering how do you 
deal with the heterogeneity of, for instance, your two data sets that you have as an input? I imagine that there is maybe different spatial resolutions, uh, different artifacts, so how do you deal with this? So t for now we have, uh, like this is an ongoing work, so for now we have uh, just resized them to a single uh, resolution. And uh, we are just using adaptive, uh, ad adaptive histogram e equalization and just uh, reducing it to, like uh, fixing a resolution and changing it to that. But we plan to do a domain adaptation, uh, we place, to place a domain adaptation just before the segmentation network, when, uh, before the input to the segmentation network, so I think it will learn better then. So, so you, are, you are what? You are taking the lowest resolution as a reference or a standard resolution? Yeah, I'm taking the lowest resolution, yeah. So you might as well be losing details in the higher resolution data set, for instance? Uh, I didn't get it. You might be ha uh, losing, oops, losing um, uh, details yeah. in the, when you are done sampling, for instance, one of the data sets, right? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So, for example, uh, the microaneurysms diseases, they are really small. They are yeah. like, like one or two pixels or something. So we lost uh, accuracy on that when we compared for the EOPTHA data set. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, like, uh, uh, like I, I think I, I showed it here. It was uh, like we lost accuracy on that. But I think if we do... Um, if we fix a greater resolution and uh, do a domain adaptation, use a cycle GAN, mm -hmm. I think, and it uh, increases the resolution of the image, and then I pass it, I think that will do better. So mm -hmm. that is what we have thought for the future. Okay. Any other question from the audience? Okay, so for the sake of time, we will continue Thank with you. the next talk. So the next talk is actually uh, work from, from here, from Imperial College, on uh, image synthesis with convolutional capsule generative adversarial networks. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Cher. I'm currently a postdoc at King's College. And today I'm going to talk about a, pro a project I did during my PhD at Imperial, um, which is investigating image synthesis using convolutional capsule GANs. So during my PhD, we collected a data set of axons using two photomicroscopy. And this kind of data is often used in neuroscience to study things like synaptic plasticity and neuronal function. And to do this, we want to, one, segment the axon and detect the synapses. So these methods actually kind of go hand in hand where we can segment the axon and actually extract the synapse location using the axon backbone intensity. So in order to improve the method of segmentation, we aim to use deep learning. However, we have a quite small data set. So our approach is to increase the amount of training data using uh, deep uh, generative uh, methods in order to improve on the task of segmentation. And we do this using um, conditional GANs trained on real data. Um, in addition, we develop a new method um, of a GAN generator using convolutional capsules. So once we have a, a trained GAN generator, we use, um, we use the GAN to synthesize additional data and use that as augmentation um, using either real or synthetic labels. So um, in our paper, um, we use uh, two different data sets. So one is a real data set collected using two photon microscopy in the mouse. Um, so here we see at the top the segmentation maps that we um, manually label. And um, below that we see the real data, which can have a variation number of axons. Um, and in addition, they would have um, uh, the synapses, which are called boutons on the axons. In addition, we use a synthetic model. Um, so this synthetic model is based on random walks in 2D space. Um, and then in addition, we have a physics-based appearance-based model, which makes um, these labels that you see um, there look more uh, realistic like axons. So in terms of the real data, we use um, this data to train our GAN um, synthetic model in order to um, learn a representation between this binary segmentation map um, and to be able to represent real axons. 
Um, our synthetic model is actually um, can be used as input into the scan generator as well. So these um, synthetic labels can also be used as input to the GAN, um, which will enable us to generate um, an infinite number of labels. In addition, these two data sets are used as baseline models um, later on in our segmentation tasks that we use to evaluate our synthetic generations from the GANs. So a GAN is built of a, a generator network and discriminator network. Um, so our, our generator network is a conditional um, generator, so it takes in as input um, the segmentation label. So the segmentation label can either be from uh, the real um, manual uh, labels or also from our synthetic um, model, which we call SSM. In addition, this network takes in a latent vector Z, which will control the output, um, the synthetic image. Our discriminator network is actually also a conditional network and takes in as input a pair of real or fake images. So in the case here, we see um, um, a binary image uh, segmentation map and the real image, and it would just classify that as real or fake and will help us train our generator. So I previously mentioned that we use convolutional capsules as our generator network. So first of all, why would we want to use capsules at all? Um, so capsules were first introduced um, in 2017 uh, by Sabor and Jeffrey Hinton um, as a way to tackle problems with CNNs. So in CNNs, um, one of the biggest problems is that it's unable to learn spatial relations between features. So um, we, we see this image here of a face, and we can clearly tell this is a face, but we know for sure that um, this image is not a face, as the eye and the mouth should not be here on the top. However, a CNN might still classify that as a face, since it doesn't actually capture um, how these features are related in space. So capsules were introduced in order to capture um, this relationship using a big weight matrix, which encodes the spatial relation. Another property of capsules that is really important to learn relationship between features is the use of dynamic routing. And dynamic routing um, works by propagating um, inputs on the fly, as in to encode them in different capsules. However, the problem of these capsules is that the big weight matrix that I mentioned is very uh, memory intensive, and that's why we haven't really seen this much in the literature since it's limited um, in the size of the images it can use. Um, in the original paper, they used uh, the MNIST data set, which is around 28 by 28 in pixel size. So last year, convolutional capsules um, were introduced um, in actually in middle um, by Lalonde et al. And um, they uh, proposed a way of using um, the power of dynamic routing, capturing relationships between features, but reducing the computation by um, removing this big weight matrix and replacing it with a convolution, which will allow it to be applied to much larger images and allow the analysis of these filters as well. So this is a relatively unexplored area of research. And um, this paper is the first application of capsules to a GAN generator. Um, so how do capsules actually work? So the input into the capsules, um, into the original capsules, is actually a vector. So this vector u, this vector u is multiplied with a weight matrix w, which um, is meant to encode relations between, um, spatial relations between features. So um, in this case, you do the weight matrix multiplication, and W gets updated um, during training using backprop. So the output um, of this layer in the capsule is U hat, which is a vector that encodes different features. The main key element of capsules is actually the dynamic routing, which takes as input um, U hat. So the key element of dynamic routing is propagating inputs on the fly. So for example, if we get an image of a face and um, these different features of a face are encoded using um, U hat. So for example, um, the top one might encode features of an eye and the mouth. 
So the idea behind it is using um, this learned parameter um, C. So C is also a vector, and it's learned during dynamic routing, not using backpop. So C will encode um, the, uh, how close these features are. So for example, if you have um, uh, eyes and a the mouth, they um, will increase C for this particular capsule as it would encode for a face. So how is C actually um, learned during dynamic routing? So you have a dot product between U hat and C, and it passes for a squash function. Um, the squash function not only normalizes um, the result of this dot product, but it would also retain the direction as to um, learn how these features are related in space. Then um, the last key step is um, the C update step. And C is updated by a dot product of U hat and V as in to learn how these features are related. This happens for every single input, which means that each capsule and the output should encode um, its related features. So in the original paper, when they used MNIST, each capsule encoded a different digit and would encode um, features that are relevant to that class. Now, um, convolutional capsules are different in a couple of ways. So first of all, the inputs are no longer vectors. They are now matrices. So these matrices are built into blocks of capsules, and each capsule has channels. So now this passes through a 2D convolution instead of this big weight matrix, which allows us to use much larger images. So the other key difference now is that U ha has extra dynamic mentions width and height, and so does the C vector, which means that the final output of the capsule will also be a 4D vector, and each capsule is meant to represent um, different features or different classes. So our generator architecture um, is built to be quite similar to a unit. So in this case, we can see that we have um, these Git connections, um, but uh, there's a few key differences. So since our uh, network is a GAN, um, we have a latent vector Z that um, is um, an input to the network, it passes through a fully connected layer and reshape to be an additional channel to the input. And the role of this latent vector is to control the output image, which means that if we change the latent vector, the output image will also change. In addition, um, there's another key difference to a regular um, unit, which is each, um, <coughs> each layer in the network is split into blocks of um, capsules, and each capsule has um, a certain number of channels. OK, finally, I'm now going to talk about um, the evaluation of our GAN synthesis model. So we decided to evaluate this network using a segmentation task and a unit that we train um, on different data sets. So we train on either the real data set, the synthetic model that I introduced at the beginning, or the result of um, different GAN models. So we compare our network to an additional state-of-the-art network called pix to pix um, which is actually the framework is very similar to what we used um, and is also using a UNAT um, as the generator. We also qualitatively evaluate um, these networks. So quantitative results are uh, summarized here. So on the very left, we see the, um, the input to the unit. So that's what we train the unit on. And in addition, we also have different labels that we use to train the unit or even to synthesize images. So as I mentioned earlier, we have both synthetic and real labels that we can input to the GAN. So SSM would be synthetic labels that we input to the GAN and SSM uh, and AR would be real labels. So pix to pix um, is the network we compare against, and caps pix to pix is our model. So um, in our very baseline results, that we found that um, p bound, which is our synthetic baseline, performs the worst, whereas pix to pix and caps pix to pix um, perform uh, relatively similarly. Um, but actually, um, if you just train on real data, we see that performance is actually best in these. Um, baselines. 
However, if we pre-train on either PIX2PIX or CAPS PIX2PIX data, we see that um, we can improve performance. And indeed, um, if we pre-train on data produced by our model, we can see that um, that's the best performance out of all the different um, experiments. Finally, um, we do a qualitative analysis of features by um, examining the last layer activations of pix to pix and caps pix to pix. Um, so, for example, if we um, image the pix to pix last layer activations, we can see that many of the features are actually quite redundant. Um, and it mainly encodes information about the axon class. However, we are also interested in the noise class, which can contain a lot of different kind of structured noise. And we can see that um, as opposed to pix to pix, caps pix to pix, one has much more variation in the type of features it can learn, but also can segregate, for example, um, the noise class from the axon class, which is very important in our case. Another way to evaluate um, the strength of our different networks is to see how much variation we can have by inputting the same label to the network. So since a GAN can vary um, the latent space, it can generate a lot of different kinds of images from the same label. So in the case of our network, um, we can input the same image and then synthesize a lot of different looking images, um, which will vary the axon intensity as well as the noise. However, um, in initial experiments in the pix to pix network, uh, unfortunately, um, the latent space um, didn't really work very well. So instead of having a latent space, they actually used dropout in order to introduce randomness to the network. And this means that uh, the variation um, from when inputting uh, the same label is actually very small um, and is hardly visible in this case. Since our network has a latent space, um, that means we can also examine um, the latent space using interpolation. And interpolation will allow us to examine how well uh, our network has captured the axon and noise class um, in our case. So to do interpolation, you, have, um, you, you take two random Z vectors and you linearly interpolate between them. You input the same in image to the network and just input these different Z vectors. So here we can see that um, at, at the very left, our axon has um, two boutons. And as we interpolate, we can see that this bouton disappears. This is one of the key features of axon intensity that we want to tune code. In addition, um, we can see that the structured nodes has also been coded very well in the network and changes across the latent space. When examining um, different features in our network, we can see that um, not only does it capture the, um, the data very well, it also can segregate these different classes. So we can see that, for example, the first capsule um, feature learns uh, about the axon or the bouton intensity. The second one will learn um, about the structured noise, and the last one learns about the background noise. So these are just a few examples of selected features. Finally, I wanted to show um, how this might actually happen um, in the network. So when we're examining intermediate layer features, we want to see how, they, uh, how the capsules group features together. So looking at the intermediate layer features, so these are convolutional capsule um, three and four. So um, each, uh, each different row is a different capsule, and each column is a different channel in the in the capsule. So we can see here clearly that um, similar features are actually grouped together in the same capsule. And since our network is in the form of a unit, um, these are combined later on. And um, we can see that um, important features have been learned by our network. OK. Um, finally, um, I just want to have a little conclusion. So um, we found out that performance segmentation using caps pix to pix and pix to pix um, is very similar, but we can actually improve on segmentation results if we pre-train on caps pix to pix data. In addition, we do this while still having um, seven times fewer parameters. 
Also, we found that um, CAP speaks to pigs can capture both the axon and noise classes um, very well by segregating and grouping different features into different capsules. In addition, we find that image synthesis is a lot more variable, which um, is actually very important if, for example, we want to synthesize um, an infinite number of images from similar labels. Um, finally, I just wanted to point out that um, following our experiments that convolutional capsules um, might be very useful for tackling uh, imbalanced data sets, data sets with lots of classes or even the problem of mode collapse in GANs as we have illustrated. Um, thank you very much for listening. I just wanted to thank um, my PhD supervisors and um, my PhD labs. Yeah, thank you very much. The floor is open for questions. We have one in the center, yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it's actually three really small questions. First of all, are the results significant in your table? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah they've been tested for significance. Okay. Um, then I was wondering what about just using a simple gun to create uh, more images and use, that, uh, use this as, as a baseline? Um, so yeah, we, we tested against pigs to pigs, which is another GAN, so. Okay, and then the very last one is, um, I'm always a bit skeptical about like, the argument about capsules, like you presented the example with the face. Yes. Um, I have hard times to see how that relates to your problem. Like, I don't see why you need this kind of composition effect so in, in your data. So I definitely agree with you in terms of um, encoding spatial relations between features. We might not find that as interesting as actually grouping uh, features together. So actually, the, the main thing that we wanted to test is whether um, capsules or even dynamic routing will be useful uh, in the problem of mode collapse in GANs when we um, want to capture different classes in our data set and be able to actually represent that. So we, as we see in pigs to pigs, it actually only picks up on the axon class and it doesn't really represent the noise class very well, which is something we also want to image. Um, but yeah, it's a very good point. So in terms of convolutional capsules that are not able to capture spatial relations between features as do regular capsules, but obviously um, the memory constraint makes it not usable in our case. We have another question here at the front on the left. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, in the original piece to piece paper, it was also mentioned that given the fact that the data set used to train the piece to piece networks, as well as uh, the data set you used to train your GANs, is that there's a one to one mapping between the segmentation maps and the image generated condition on that segmentation map. Yeah. So, so in piece to piece, is also a conditional GAN. That is correct. So. In this, condition, uh, this conditional GAN and in this particular setting, because there is a one-to-one -one mapping, this happens in peaks to peaks, meaning that uh, it ignores the latent and random latent distribution because there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the condition and the target generated image. I'm wondering why the same did not happen for your capsule GAN, but because it's apparently it's what happened for your peaks to peaks version. Yeah, so when I read the original pix to pix paper, um, uh, they said in their initial experiments, they, they tried to add a latent space, but um, for some reason it completely ignored the latent space and didn't learn anything from it. Um, it in my experiments, um, I just used the pix to pix as they presented in the paper using dropout. So um, uh, in my opinion, the reason why um, my network didn't suffer from the same problem is because of the dynamic routing of how it propagates um, different features and groups them into classes. So in a way, this um, 
this type of method almost imposes it um, to learn these different features um, because it has to group them in similar capsules. Thank you. All right. If there is no more questions, let's uh, thank the speaker again. So now we will start with the power pitch, I mean, the spotlights uh, talks. So I would recommend the speakers to be close to the podium. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Mark Borris and I'm gonna present uh, my work uh, done in the Insight Center for Data Analytics and uh, Image Processing Group of Catalonia University of uh, Polytechnic of Barcelona. Um, so the motivation of our method was uh, to design uh, an end-to-end -end convolutional architecture to automatically quantify uh, the neo uh, in the X-ray uh, images. So um, using uh, these methods, um, um, most of the gold standards in the medicine that is using this Kelvin-Lawrence grading scale in order to quantify the severity of the knee uh, images. So um, all, uh, this grading scale, uh, it concentres uh, all the information mainly in the knee joint <laughs> areas in the, in the, in the whole uh, X-ray image. And all this information is located in a very uh, small area in the whole image. So most of the state-of-the-art uh, methods uh, propose like the use of two uh, networks uh, to first segment uh, the structured joints and then uh, classify the severity of uh, these, jo these uh, knee joints. So this method uh, requires a, a pre-training of uh, this uh, segmentation uh, network and also like a, a, um, a manual annotation of the segmentation maps. So we propose like to avoid this uh, localization step and to use attention as a way like uh, to focus the classifier uh, to the most informative areas in these uh, images. So in that case, we propose the use of attention model that can be um, located in a, a arbitrary convolutional pipeline. And uh, these uh, uh, attention models uh, uh, can be uh, combined uh, to extract uh, attention features and then combine all of these attention features to, uh, to produce the final locations. So um, these attention models uh, can take uh, a convolutional, uh, a feature convolutional um, space, and uh, and then like <laughs> the attention, the, the attention models can be trained uh, in a supervised way in order to focus the classifier to the final, uh, to the final decisions. So um, we propose like to to um, to use uh, and uh, attention models and then to use a combinational model that can fuse um, um, in an arbitrary way these local features. So using this method, um, um, we um, avoid uh, this uh, segmentation step uh, um, to extract the knee joints, and we, we perform other methods using this uh, um, pre-localization step. And also, um, we reach uh, the, the human level uh, accuracy um, using the Kappa coefficient in order to compare the, the, the human performance to this convolutional model. And that's all. If you have any questions and other um, more details, I mean the poster session uh, downstairs. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, welcome. My name is Janis Hagener, and uh, we present some work on personalized aortic valve prothesis here. So we want to personalize aortic valve prothesis actually, and um, this mainly says that we want to uh, want to estimate the optimal shape of the of the three leaflets that form this valve. Uh, to be honest, we already uh, already solved the issue um, because the biggest problem is um, the, that three D imaging of the aortic valve structure is not really possible. Um, but we presented an approach already to, um, to estimate these leaflet shapes from some um, surrounding tissue information. Um, so we presented this and people came to us and said, yeah, well, this is nice, but this is not realistic because it's uh, too expensive, um, you have big logistic issues, and you will never get regu regulation for this. So we said, yeah, well, you're right. So we came up with a new approach and said, um, well, is there something in between um, one size fits all, as it is now, and full personalization, where we have really tailored prothesis 
cases for each and every patient. And actually the, uh, the thing in between that we uh, try to tackle and what we present here is um, identifying uh, typical shapes of aortic valves so that we can say this is, these are five different prosthesis shapes that we can offer. And um, yeah, th this basically leads us to a clustering approach. Um, we want to do clustering, but we can't do this directly in the image space. And this is why we um, came up with a, with a pipeline that we present here. Um, at first, we needed a data set. Um, as I said, imaging is not, um, not really good possible, so we did some work around where we cut out these leaflets from pause and aortic valves. And then um, we trained an autoencoder to find a good representation of our aortic valve. And in this representation, when we already, um, already trained our autoencoder, we can perform clustering in a sensible way because we have good features. And from these um, cluster centers, the good thing is that we can evaluate the prosthesis because we can generate images of this prosthesis, of this shape, um, using the decoder network. The whole pipeline looks like this. Um, don't want to get into detail, but um, we can uh, encode all the three uh, leaflets that form one valve. So we um, concatenate this to have the valve representation here, and then we can cluster, and uh, we can generate the prosthesis here. Um, I don't want to uh, get into details about the results. We can um, discuss this um, at the poster. The cool thing is we can do um, analysis on how many clusters we need, so how many prosthesis should be um, there present in the wild. Um, the, the main thing is that we present an end-to-end -end method for um, unsupervised uh, prosthesis shape identification um, directly on images. And this is not only limited to aortic valve prosthesis, but to basically each kind of shape that we can image in the body. Yeah, thanks. Would be happy to see you at the poster. Hi, my name is Fabian Bausiger, and I'm working on the reconstruction of magnetic resonance fingerprinting. So uh, magnetic resonance fingerprinting, or MRF, is a concept for quantitative uh, MR imaging. It relies on a pseudo-randomized uh, sequence uh, with undersampling of the case space. So from this acquisition, which is usually quite fast, in our case 50 seconds, uh, we obtain unique signal evolution or fingerprints per tissue type at each voxel. Using uh, these fingerprints, we can match them to a dictionary of pre-computed fingerprints and reconstruct parametric maps. Unfortunately, this process is quite slow, can require several hours. So we aim to use uh, deep learning uh, to replace this dictionary matching. Uh, we use an MRF sequence to image disease skeletal muscles with five parametric maps, and we have a data set of 164 uh, patients, uh, which is highly heterogeneous. So our method uh, relies on a 2D CNN, which reconstructs the parametric maps patchwise, so we input uh, a patch of fingerprints and predict the parametric maps at this uh, location. Details of the CNN come to my poster. So regarding the results, we have uh, quite good agreement between the dictionary matching and our uh, reconstruction quantitatively and qualitatively. So we were in particular interested in the spatial and temporal influence uh, of the reconstruction in this study. So uh, regarding the spatial influence, we were right uh, receptive field of the CNN on the x-axis from one squared to 21 squared and we also write the number of parameters of the CNN. And we found that the receptive, receptive fields uh, between 15 squared and 21 squared work uh, fairly good for our uh, MRF sequence. Uh, so regarding the temporal influence, uh, we applied occlusion experiments to the temporal dimension of the fingerprints, and we found that uh, at the first few temporal frames, we have a quite high importance for T1 quantification which makes physically sense because we apply an inversion pulse uh, at the uh, very beginning of the sequence. We also have quite uh, a high correlation between the importance and the changes of the AMRF sequence. So in conclusion, uh, AMRF reconstruction using deep learning is feasible, it's accurate and fast, and we found that we benefit from the spatial correlation of fingerprints for the reconstruction and that the CNN extracts physically meaningful features from the fingerprints. Uh, come and visit me at the poster uh, FT4. Thank you very much. Um, 
I apologize on behalf of my student, but uh, the, she couldn't get a visa. Uh, so, um, so I'm going to talk about the problem that you all have uh, and the fact that deep neural nets need a lot of training data. So um, let me uh, talk about uh, the case that we are studying has to do with nuclear segmentation and histopathology images. This collaboration with the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. And we want to identify uh, masks for every nucleus in an image and we want to do instant segmentation. And the nuclear, uh, the, the nuclear uh, features are important uh, indicators, of course, of the presence of severity of the disease. And we care about uh, features like average size, nucleus to cytoplasm ratio, et cetera. So there's a lot of research we've been doing over the years, and we keep doing with them. So the question is, how do you find the nuclear? So, and the motivations, of course, car state-of-the-art segmentation methods are based on deep learning and they have achieved much better performance over the past few years. And of course, but the problem is they require large amounts of pixel level annotation data. And the annotation is not free, obviously it's very expensive. And domain knowledge, of course, is required. You can just get a student to annotate. It's time consu consuming. And for example, 115 minutes on, a, on an image of size 900 by 900, the images are big. And 60 hours for 30 images. So, can we achieve similar performance using much less annotation effort, for example, weak annotation? So there's been a lot of related work, uh, uh, and some people use image level uh, tags, which creates a little inf information, scribbles, um, not convenient enough, and bounding box are also expensive, not expensive, and very hard. And what we do is points because they are much easier and they convey enough information. So as you see, you do it in batches, in small batches with respect to image, so you can see how many nuclei there are. So the, we have a method with using three, three steps. The first two types of coarse labels. First, we create, uh, we have two, two, we extract two types of coarse labels, Voronoi partition, Voronoi diagram, uh, points and Voronoi edges. And you can get an initial uh, information here. And k-means clustering, morphology opening to create clusters. And then you use that as input to initial training a unit-like structure with a cross-entropy loss. And then the fine-tuning, uh, something else that you should also be aware of, I come from Toronto for many years, like uh, with Hinton when I took the first courses. The problem with your nets is they are very good, but they are sometimes not very accurate. So traditional methods, you should never forget, are good. So if you use CRF now afterwards to refine your traditional methods, they are very good. So combination of neural nets with methods like CRF, for example, can do a lot better and using the CRF loss. So in all the experiments, we find that we do better with this kind of combinations of methods. And we have two data sets, lung cancers, uh, lung cancer data sets, and multi-organ data sets with different cancers. And based on the various indices we can discuss at the poster, we do better. And here's some results. So you can see the original image, the true mask, for noise labels, cluster, and of course, both labels. Of course, they do better. Uh, so in conclusion, we have proposed a new week weekly supervised nuclear segmentation method using only points annotation. We generate the Voronoi labels and cluster labels from the point label, took advantage of the dense CRF loss to refine the trained model. So it proposed methods comparable performance as fully supervised uh, methods, and, but requires much less annotation effort, which is what uh, the biologists work with want. So basically allows to, uh, uh, to analyze large amounts of data. So thank you and come to the poster, please. Thank you. All right, so this concludes uh, the session. I don't know if Tom has any announcements before we run for coffee, or Ben. No, then let's run for coffee. <laughs>
Hello everyone. Uh, we will get started with our fourth uh, oral session on uh, weak and unsupervised learning. So I'm Carol Stud from uh, King's College London and uh, I will be chairing this session with uh, Marlon de Bruyne from Rotterdam. So our first uh, speaker is uh, Ruben Dorant uh, that will talk about us about uh, learning uh, joint lesion and tissue segmentation from task-specific heteromodal datasets. Hi, everyone. Does it work? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. It's an extreme pleasure for me to be here and to present the work we did on how to learn to perform tissue and lesion segmentation using existing datasets that are task-specific and heteromodal. So what we want to do is to develop a joint model for lesion and tissue segmentation. So in this work, we will be focused on the white matter lesions. So what we want to do is given a set of scans, for instance, a T1 and a flare scan, we want to automatically segment the white matter lesions and the different structures of the brain, such as the gray matter, the white matter, the cerebellum, or the ventricles. The problem is that there is no large data set that is available with the full set of annotations. So with the, the annotation of the lesions and the annotations of the different structures of the brain. Instead, there are some data sets that are task specific, meaning that they either provide the annotation for the different structures of the brain, such as neuromorphometrics, or they provide the annotation for the lesions, such as uh, white matter hyperintensity. So, and because these data sets have been developed uh, in the scope of tissue segmentation or lesion segmentation, the modalities that are provided for each of these data sets are not the same. So they are heteromodal. Uh, in neuromorphometrics, we only have access to the T1 scans. And in WMH, we have access to the T1 and the FLIR scans. So for the rest of the presentation, we will name uh, lesion data uh, WMH because it's the data set that contains uh, the white matter lesions. And, and we will name uh, the control data set neuromorphometrics because uh, the patients have no uh, large deformation due to paleontology. So to sum up, uh, what we want to do is to learn a joint model for tissue and lesion segmentation, given that there is no large data set that is available with the full set of annotations of the tissue and the lesion annotations. And what we propose to do is to leverage the existing data sets that are task specific, so either with the tissue annotations or the lesion annotation, but never both of them, and heteromodal, so either the T1 scans or the T1 plus pair scans. So basically, this problem lies at the intersection of multiple branches of machine learning, multitask learning, how to learn two tasks at the same time, weekly supervised learning, how to learn with missing annotations, and transfer learning, domain adaptation, how to learn from heteromodal data set, and in particular, how can we learn a knowledge from a specific subset of modality, for instance, T1, and transfer this knowledge to the fact when, when the inputs are T1 and flare. So since we want to, uh, to develop a unique joint model, and because we are dealing with data sets that are heteromodal, we need a network architecture that allows for missing modalities. So what we propose is a combination between HEMIS and IRSNet, two state-of-the-art architectures. So first, we extract features from uh, each of the modalities independently. Uh, so you can see here the features from the T1 scan and here the features from the flare scan. And then we average uh, these two feature maps. So when we have access to the two feature maps, we'll, here it will be the average of these two feature maps. And if we only have access to the T1 scan, it will, this mean here will be exactly the feature maps that are extracted from the T1 scan. And after, we perform uh, the tissue and the lesion segmentation on the rest of the network. So basically, this network architecture allows us to deal with missing modalities. The question now is, how can we train such a network? So first, I would like to give the intuition of our method. So in the lesion data set, we have access to the T1, the flare scan, and the, t the lesion annotation. So we can learn to perform lesions annotation by comparing the predictions, the lesion uh, outputs, to the ground truth. However, we cannot do so for uh, the tissue segmentation because we don't have access to the tissue annotations. In parallel, we can also train a network to perform uh, 
tissue segmentation using the T1 control scans that are available and comparing the output, the tissue output, with the ground truth that is provided in the control data set. The question now is, is the tissue segmentation working when the, when the inputs are T1 and flare? The answer is no, it won't work. Why? Because when we learn, or when we train a network to perform tissue segmentation by using the T1 control scans, here in the mean, we only have the T1 information. And when the inputs are T1 and flare, it also contains the flare information. So this will create a perturbation for the rest of the network and the tissue outputs will be noisy. However, we realize that the T1 scans are similar in the two data sets. It's on the part of the uh, brain that doesn't contain any lesion. So what we said is that we can use the T1 scans here from the uh, lesion data set, perform tissue uh, segmentation, and minimize the differences between the two predictions. So using T1 as input and T1 plus flare as input. And by minimizing the difference, we can learn to perform tissue segmentation when the inputs are T1 and flare. So this is for the intuition. Um, now we would like to move to the mathematical formulation of a problem. So we have access to a T1 and a flare scan. In the perfect scenario, we also have access to the full set of annotations, so the lesion annotations and the tissue annotations. And what we want to do is to find a function H, or our neural network, parameterized by the weights theta, that minimizes the differences between the output of this network and the ground truth. So for that, we will use a certain loss. And as we can see, uh, the segmentation map can be, in fact, decomposed into two segmentation maps, one for the tissue and one for the lesion. Now, if our last function has a one versus all strategy, which is the case from the cross entropy and we just have seen in the previous work, uh, or the dice or the uh, jacquard, in this case, we can also decompose our last function into a tissue loss and a lesion loss. So now what we want to do is to minimize uh, this joint loss, so the sum of these two uh, task-specific losses. So in this work, we'll be focused on the uh, data distribution that comes from the patient group, because uh, this is the group of interest uh, in our work. And so what we want to do is the best parameters that minimize the expectation of, the, of these two losses. So the expectation of the tissue loss here and the expectation of the lesion loss here. And for minimizing these expectations, we need to estimate them. So here, uh, we directly uh, can estimate them by using the, uh, the lesion data set. Why? Because we have access to the T1, the flare scan, and the lesion annotations. However, we cannot do so for this data set. Why? Because we are missing the uh, tissue annotations. So the question is, could we use the control data set? And the first answer is no. Why? Because we don't have access to the flare scan uh, in the control data set. So what we propose is to find an upper bound that is computationally tractable. So we want to estimate this term here in order to uh, minimize uh, this uh, term. So as we can see, in fact, it's uh, the expectation of the distance between the output using T1 and flare to the ground truth. Now, if our loss function satisfies the triangle inequality, which is the case for the Jacquard loss function, it's not the case for the dice, not the case for the cross entropy. In this case, the distance between the prediction using T1 and FLAIR as input to the ground truth is lower than the distance, be the sum of the distance between the two predictions using T1 and FLAIR and T1 only as input, and the prediction using T1 as input and uh, the ground truth. So this is the triangle inequality. And in terms of expectations, we obtain this upper bound. So here, the upper bound. Uh, that corresponds to this term, and here the upper bound, the, the expectation, sorry, that corresponds to this term. The question now is can we estimate this upper bound? Uh, so, in fact, here we can directly estimate this term by using the lesion data set because we have access to the T1, the flare scan, and we also, have, we also need to have access to the same T1. So, it's uh, possible in the lesion data set because it doesn't require to have any uh, uh, tissue annotations. However, here again, we are missing the tissue annotations. So you will tell me we go around a circle, we are back to the original problem. How can we use the, uh, the, the control data set to estimate this term? And here the problem is no more on the fact that we are missing the, t the flare modality, but on the data distribution. However, uh, if we 
make the assumption that the distribution are the same on the non-lesion part of the brain. In this case, these two probabilities are the same. And so we can directly, so these two expectations will also be the same. So the expectation on the uh, data distribution of the lesion and the expectation on the control data distribution. And now we can directly estimate uh, this expectation by using the control data set because we have access to the T1 scan and the tissue annotations. So at the end, what we want to do is to find the best parameters here that minimize the sum of these three expectations. And all of them are computationally tractable by either it's using the lesion data set or the control data set. So this is for uh, the method. And now with what we will do is a mini batch uh, stochastic gradient descent. So at each training iteration, we will use one T1 scan from the control data set and compare the tissue segmentation output to the ground truth that is provided in this data set. We will also compare the, uh, the two tissue segmentation output when we use T1 as input and T1 plus flare as input. And finally, we will compare our lesion segmentation map with the, uh, with the labels that are provided, so the, the lesion annotations, uh, on when, when the inputs are T1 and flare. So this is for the training procedure. So at each iteration, we will compute the, the sum of these three losses, and we will uh, compute the gradient descent on that. So now let's move to the experiment. Uh, so we want to uh, segment different classes. So the white matter lesions, uh, the gray matter, the white matter, the cerebellum, the basal ganglial, the brainstem, and the ventricles. For that, we have access to different data set, WMH. So there is 60 T1 and flare scans with the uh, lesion annotations only. We have access to neuromorphometrics, so we can combine the 155 structures into these six uh, tissue classes. Uh, we have access to 28 uh, T1 scans, and we can use uh, um, a validated method for uh, augmenting the data to reach 60 scans uh, that is validated on the healthy patient. So this is our case here, it's the control data set. And we use the uh, control data of ADNI. Um, and now we also have a small data set, so only seven scans, with the T1 and the flare that is fully annotated. So in this data set, we have access to the tissue annotation and the lesion annotation. So this data set is MRBrains. So this is the fully uh, annotated data set, but as we can see, it's pretty small compared to these two ones. So we can uh, compare different models. So first, uh, the two joint models, so our model that is trained on uh, WMH and neuromorphometrics using our method. And we can also uh, uh, compute the joint model that is fully supervised, that is trained on MR brains. So here we have the full set of annotations. So this is M. And we can also compare a model to the task-specific model, so the models that only tries to perform tissue segmentation uh, that is trained on neuromorphometrics, so using the T1 scans from neuromorphometrics, and the model that only tries to perform lesion segmentation and that is trained on WMH uh, using the T1 and the flare scans. So for that, we computed the dice score on these different data sets. And so here, uh, this is our method. Here, this is the model that only uh, performs tissue segmentation. As, as we can see, we reach very comparable performances on this, uh, on this data set. So it's slightly uh, better, but so basically it's comparable. However, when we look at the, uh, the fully supervised model that is trained on the small data set, it doesn't work well on the on neuromorphometrics. We can do the same comparison on WMH, and as we can see, again, we reach comparable performances between our model and the task-specific model. And again, the uh, small fully supervised model, so the fully supervised model that is trained on the small data set uh, uh, didn't reach this performance. Now we also submitted our model to, uh, to uh, MR brains because the MR brains is a challenge, uh, which allows us to compare a method with some uh, well-established methods such as SPM. And we can see that we outperform uh, SPM. So especially if you look at the white matter lesion, it's pretty clear. Uh, now we can also compare a model with the fully supervised model. So here, a model never has seen any uh, data from MR brains. Um, and as we can see, so if you look at uh, the white matter lesion, it's, uh, it's good. Here it's also good. Here it's also good. However, so we have two problems, one for the gray matter here and one for the brainstem. And we try to understand why quantitatively these results were lower for these two classes and for the rest it was good. 
And in fact, it's due to the differences in the annotation protocol between the two data sets. So the first row, you can see neuromorphic matrix and a uh, scan from neuromorphic matrix and the annotations that are provided. And here, a scan from MR brands and the annotations that are provided. And it's pretty clear that the brand stem in yellow uh, are not annotated in a consistent way. We can also see that the contours of the, uh, of the uh, gray matter are definitely smoother here than here. And this is due to the fact that neuromorphic matrix uh, didn't segment the uh, CSF. So now uh, we can see the output of the different networks. So this is the network that is uh, fully supervised. We can see that it doesn't work well at all on neural metrics, but it works quite well on MR brain, so uh, the same uh, data. Um, and now we can see the output of our network, and we can see that it works well on neural metrics, and that quantitative, qualitatively it works well on MR brains also. So here, basically, the, the, the brain stem is segmented similarly to the protocol of uh, annotation in neuromorphic metrics. So that explains why we didn't reach uh, good performances for the brain stem and the, uh, the gray matter. But for the rest, it's good. Now we can also look at uh, the output uh, on, uh, on uh, WMH. So here we have a T1 scan from the WMH and the annotation. So here we only have access to the lesion annotations. Um, this is the output of uh, the network that only tries to perform tissue segmentation. This is the output of the network that only tries to perform lesion segmentation. And this is a model. So we can see that it combines well this two task specific model. And which is particularly interesting here is that the input of this model are the T1 and the flare scans, when the input of these models are only the T1. So it really shows that we preserve the knowledge that we can learn from the T1 scans when the inputs are T1 and flare. Oh. <laughs> A small spoil. Um, and here we can see the, the output of the network uh, that is trained on the MR brand, so the fully supervised model. And as we can see, it doesn't perform well on the uh, WMH. So to conclude, uh, what we showed is that a joint model, uh, we train a joint model on two task-specific data sets that are hetero model. We reach uh, comparable performance to the task-specific model and the fully supervised models. And we can also see that the knowledge that we learn from one modality is preserved when more modalities are used as input. So when the knowledge that we learn from T1 scans uh, is preserved when the T1 and the flare are the input. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, you don't have to annotate a new data set if the annotations are already available. Any question from the audience? Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, in the derivation of your loss function, you make this assumption that seems for me quite strong that these two expectations or even the joint probabilities of the two data sets have to uh, be the same. Have you tried to estimate how big your, the error is that you introduce if this is not the case? So what we did is that as pre-processing, we uh, normalized the two data sets uh, using histogram normalization and uh, uh, using a whitening, so uh, removing the, the mean and divided by the standard derivation. And so when we look at the uh, histogram using, uh, for instance, FSL, it was quite uh, working well. So we just did that as a preliminary experiment, but we didn't report it in the, in the, um, in the, um, in the paper. But you also have like the label distribution in there in the joint. So if this, if this doesn't align, so isn't that we mean, a problem? I mean, I mean we removed the lesion uh, uh, information when we computed these uh, histograms. So because this assumption is only on the part of the brain that only on con contains uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lesions. So because in fact, to, uh, to um, compute this expectancy, it's only on the part of the brain without the lesions. So where we have the tissue annotations. So basically what we are saying is that on the, on the different area that corresponds to the tissues, we make the assumptions that the distribution are similar. Okay. But not on the lesions, obviously. Okay. Thank you. Uh, nice work. I have the following question. 
So I, in most I, neuroradiology exams in clinical practice, you usually have multiple sequences available. So the fact that for one annotated data set, you just had T1 and no flare is basically just specific to a uh, publicly available data set, but not to clinical practice. Have you thought about synthesizing um, the missing sequence, the, uh, the flare images, uh, from uh, uh, maybe the T1 plus additional information from other data sets using some neural networks, maybe some GAN or so? Okay, so two, two answers. Uh, first, uh, if you look at the different data sets, so even if you compare to BRAD, so the Guillaume data set, the modalities are, are not always the same. So clinically, even though I agree with you that we can have the flare in most of the cases, we won't have exactly the same uh, 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 set of modalities in the different data sets. Uh, so after to answer to the question of how can we generate um, uh, some, uh, some new data, uh, so the missing annotations, uh, so, so the missing modalities, sorry. So basically, there are some work, and especially we submitted something at Mika that has been accepted that uh, encode all the uh, different modalities into a, a common feature space using a multimodal VI uh, in order to deal with missing modalities. So it's possible to do that. Uh, but here in our model, we didn't try to do that. We really try. Uh, so it, it was really more on the formulation of the problem and how we can optimize this problem. So yes, we tried that. And it, uh, it's, it quite worked better, in fact, than this type of network architecture. Thank you. Any more questions? So I, I must admit I was a little bit disappointed by your results. So you, <laughs> okay. um, you show similar performance of the joint model and the, and the task specific models, which is already really nice, of course. But I had hoped that perhaps the two tasks could benefit from each other and lead to better performance. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Would it maybe in a in even smaller training sets uh, could, could so, happen? Uh, so if you look at the tissue segmentation, uh, it works better. So here are the results that we reported uh, outperform the tissue segmentation model that only tries to perform tissue segmentation. So, so it's slightly higher, but I agree there is no big gap. Uh, and it's slightly also lower on the value image. So I agree with you. Um, but the whole point of this type of approach is uh, we can see everything in terms of performance, but we can also try to, to create a joint model that is equivalent to this two joint model, because having a joint model has a lot of uh, uh, good uh, aspects. And especially if you look at, uh, if you try to do a uncertainty estimation, it's really uh, easier to have a single uh, model and not two different models. So yes, in terms of uh, performances, uh, we have similar performances. We didn't uh, improve uh, a lot. Uh, we can also see that, in fact, uh, we, so we have a new architecture now, and it, we reach a higher performance on the white matter legend. Um, so this should also be submitted. But uh, so at the end, yes, the motivation was uh, that we, we have a better generalization using two different data sets. So we also have to show that. Um, but using a small data set uh, is not super relevant when we want to generalize it to another data set, so using the, the existing ones. Uh, so th this is a big aspect. And the other one is, uh, uh, is yes, in terms of, for instance, uncertainty uh, estimation, it's really easier with a, with a joint model compared to two different models that don't perform uh, the same. Right, thank you. I think we should move on to the next presentation. So the next paper is segmenting potentially cancerous areas in prostate biopsies using semi-automatically annotated data. And the talk will be given by Nikolai Borlutsky from Context Vision. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. So actually first I would like to start with uh, uh, background and motivation, why we did this research. And actually uh, a small Swedish company, Context Vision, started around five years a new unit called Digital Pathology Business Unit and uh, started applying machine learning and deep learning to cancer-related data and mostly images, huge whole slide images. And also started participating in different challenges and last year in May 
we got the second place in Chameleon Challenge. And uh, using uh, this experience which we accumulated, we started to develop a decision support tool for pathologists. And uh, typical task which we usually do, it's like predicting whether there is cancer or no cancer in scanned tissue, segmenting out cancer areas in a scanned image. Thank you. Uh, classifying the cancer into one of several types uh, and also prognostication of patients. So it's typical tasks in digital pathology. And actually, it's very challenging, and uh, we every day uh, face different uh, challenges, such as um, ground truth. There is no ground truth. It's very subjective. But there is always room for improvement, and some ground truth is more objective than other. And also communication, bridging the gap between uh, deep learning experts, machine learning experts, and pathologists is quite challenging, because it's like two different worlds which we are trying to merge into one. And images are huge. It's, uh, one image can be more than 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So it's uh, challenging to fit that, uh, these images into memory, and it's computationally expensive. And gathering the data is also it's a challenge. There are many ethical approvals, which are different across different uh, institutions and countries. And even more important, to gather reliable, high-quality data with good uh, enough variation. And actually, just to uh, introduce you to prostate cancer. So actually, uh, Gleason grading is used as a clinical standard for grading prostate cancer. And this grading is very subjective, and it suffers from high variability. And uh, actually, there is a effect that the absence of basal cells, actually, glands, they have basal cells, the cells on the, uh, like, base of uh, glands. And the absence of basal cells actually is a strong indicator of uh, prostate adenocarcinoma. And uh, we actually introduced uh, glands without basal cells. As a, so if a gland has no basal cells, we say this gland is potentially cancerous. And actually this uh, uh, definition allowed us to provide, uh, to get more objective uh, ground truth. And the beauty is that to detect with uh, a glands without basal cells. We can use a specific immunostaining, uh, one staining for glandular tissue, so we can segment out glands, and the other one is for basal cells, so we can understand which gland is healthy and which one is potentially cancerous. And uh, I'll try to show you. So, for example, this is an overlay of uh, hematoxylin and eosin image with the immunostained uh, immunostainings. So you can maybe see this. These glands, actually, the green one is epithelial uh, uh, tissue, and these glands actually have some basal cells. It's maybe hard to see, but trust me. And uh, these, uh, actually, glands, they lack uh, basal cells, and even more, uh, this red one is MRCAR, which is actually a biomarker for uh, cancer. So actually, using this immunofluorescence channel, we can generate uh, ground truth, these red areas is actually uh, potentially cancerous areas. So we use it uh, applying a uh, dense estimator fil filter. And uh, again, so we generate uh, using uh, gl glandular uh, tissue without basal cells, we can generate ground truth, which is more objective. And one of the problems still exists that there is a lot of data variability. So you can see every every uh, row is a uh, different source. You see some images are more pinkish, some are like quite faint color. So there's a lot of variability in uh, h and &E staining. And it uh, depends uh, on a scanner, on uh, the way that uh, the tissue is uh, prepared and stained in the lab. So actually, uh, dealing with this variation uh, is very important. One can collect data from different scanners, different labs, and also use uh, more automatic uh, data augmentation methods. So actually, using this, uh, um, we call it master annotation method, we uh, managed to generate uh, data for uh, different patients scanned by different scanners for prostatectomies. Prostatectomies is a, a huge piece of pr prostate slice, which is after resection, so it's uh, after prostate was removed. And also biopsies. So why do we use prostatectomies? The reason is uh, prostatectomies provide a lot of tissue, a lot of data. 
And uh, biopsies actually are used in clinical practice. So our goal is to predict well on biopsies. And uh, prostectomy is actually, one prostectomy can be 40 times more than biopsy. So actually it provides us uh, uh, with a lot of data. And also, uh, so we have data. Next is to train uh, a model which performs well. So actually, uh, so after participating in Chameleon Challenge, we gathered, it, we managed to build in-house uh, framework which actually is quite flexible. We use it for breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, lung cancer, and colorectal cancer projects. And actually this framework you would ask, like what's special about it? What's allowed us to achieve good results? So actually one of the uh, main uh, feature of this framework is uh, uses quasi online hard example mining. We call it smart sampling, at least in house. <laughs> and uh, the idea is, uh, let's say if you have, when you train on uh, images, let's say this is annotation, uh, and then you predict on your trained data. And then you actually build error map by comparing your prediction with the uh, annotation. And then actually you uh, sample from uh, areas where the model makes uh, mistakes. So you kind of enforce the model to learn more from the areas which uh, model struggles. And the second actually uh, feature is that we use, uh, we compose models into directed acyclic graph structure. So let's say we train first a model on uh, uh, one resolution, let's say one micrometer per pixel, and then we predict on uh, training data, and then actually we start training another model on, uh, uh, let's say, different resolution, for example, two micrometers per pixel. And then we use uh, the uh, predictions from first model as an input as in one channel for training the second model. And you can see that, uh, for example, this is uh, HNE image, and different models can predict quite differently. They learn different things, and ground truth is, for example, like this. And then these uh, models you can combine into direct acyclic graph, and uh, we uh, actually uh, benefit from this. It's uh, because actually it's equivalent of ensembling, and it allows to uh, combine different resolutions. Also, as I mentioned, there is a lot of variation in HNE stainings, and of course, we apply some augmentation, which, of course, geometric augmentation like rotating, mirroring. Then we uh, adjust uh, color, like using brightness. Uh, and also, we uh, use elastic deformation, but of course, we try to preserve the morphology. We don't want to disturb the image too much. And it's done uh, during the training continuously. <laughs> So more about experiments. So we trained uh, several models. So we trained first model only on prostatectomies, a lot of data, huge images. And then we predicted on, uh, let's say, test set biopsies. Then we trained model only on biopsies and predicted on uh, biopsies. And then we trained also a model uh, we fine-tuned model which was trained on prostatectomies with, the, uh, with biopsies. And uh, we compared results. We tried to understand what's the best way to combine prostectomies and biopsies. And these are other results. So actually, as I described, we use uh, for this paper uh, two nodes in directed acyclic graph. So we train one model on uh, one micrometer per pixel. And then we actually used the uh, predictions as an input for a uh, compound model, which is uh, one and two micrometers per pixel. So actually for biopsies, for biopsies, uh, sorry, for prostectomies, you can see the red one curve, uh, this dashed line. It's uh, the, worst, the worst performance. Uh, and once we train only on uh, biopsies, actually the results are better. And uh, for a model which was trained, the model which was trained on prostectomies and then fine-tuned on biopsies, we got the best results F1 score. It's uh, uh, per pixel, uh, calculated per pixel. So, and you also can see that uh, compounding models was consistently improving the performance. But the question is, okay, so we have this F1 score, what does it mean? Is it good? Are pathologists happy? So then we actually asked three pathologists to annotate our test set independently using only HNE images. 
And then uh, we also predicted uh, with uh, the best model which we have, which I demonstrated, compound model uh, on uh, our test set. And then actually we got, you can see in red, it's our prediction. This is for F1 score, this is for sensitivity and specificity. And you can see that actually um, the performance of our deep learning model is comparable to pathologists. This is one of prediction, which is, I take is pa from paper, actually from more examples. So actually you can see there is a correlation between uh, prediction and the ground truth. And even more, this is, I think, the most interesting. Uh, we found, I mean, our model found interesting examples uh, which actually pathologists missed. So for example, this is the ground truth, which anot was annotated by a pathologist who had access to um, immunostaining, so he knew where glands are, where basal cells are, and where MACR uh, was. Uh, sorry, MACR and uh, basal, uh, and uh, epithelial. Uh, sorry, uh, MACR and uh, basal cells, yeah. And uh, then uh, our model managed to predict quite accurately that that gland, particular gland, is potentially cancerous. And same here. And here you can see also correlation. And pathologists totally missed this uh, uh, these areas. So it's interesting why it happened. So to summarize the results so far, that uh, uh, the model produced promising predictions for the test biopsies, and uh, the model performed on par with uh, three pathologists. And also, it's, uh, we are currently investigating what the model even found missed by the pathologist areas in a few biopsies. So more details you can find in the paper, and uh, you can come and see our poster. I think it's OT4. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> Hi. Um, I wonder what is the percentage of high-grade tumor compared to low-grade tumor in your data set? Because I imagine low-grade is more difficult to detect. And also, do you have uh, so in your negative samples benign lesions which are not uh, cancerous? Sorry, can you repeat? So low. So what is the proportion of low-grade cancer to high-grade ah, okay. cancer in your data? Okay, okay, because okay. I, my assumption is that low-grade is more difficult to detect. And also, do you have benign lesions in your negative samples? Yes, yes. So actually, uh, we actually there's a table in the paper. I don't remember the numbers, but uh, there is actually a distribution of different Gleason uh, patterns or Gleason, uh, yeah, Gleason scores, Gleason scores, sorry, in, uh, which we used for training and for tests. So you can see. I don't remember the numbers, but let's say for test uh, biopsies. Uh, uh, we had like 63, I think, biopsies from several sources from different labs. And we had uh, there uh, and uh, benign and uh, cancerous. And I would say, at least to my memory, I, I might be wrong because I need to see the uh, numbers. Uh, we had maybe more four and four, like uh, higher grade. But I mean, you can check uh, in a paper. We can discuss it because I don't remember the number, sorry. Was there another question? It's, it's hard to see from here. Thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, I have two questions. One regarding how robust is the model with respect to the uh, tissue embedding and the um, thickness. And the second is, uh, have you looked at TMAs? Let's uh, start with the first one. So tissue embedding, yeah? <laughs> What is tissue embedding? I don't know. So the tissue, emb the embedding, uh, did you only look at paraffin embedded sections ah, yeah, or yeah, yeah, cry yeah, sections? Yeah, 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 uh, formalin fixed pa paraffin embedded, yeah. yeah. And the thickness? Uh, uh, the thickness, actually, it's a good question because, uh, yeah, it varies from lab to lab, but I would say the average thickness, I think, is like four micrometers. I'm not sure, like something like four. But uh, let's say we tissue we have uh, they would uh, be quite same thickness, but we tested our model actually on quite thick because some labs, uh, like, you know, the uh, tissue is thicker. It's like sometimes even like two like uh, layers of uh, 
cells are kind of overlapping. But we, what we noticed actually, it's quite hard to say at least uh, for now that it's an issue. Okay, the last one was uh, the TMA. Did you look at TMAs? Uh, actually, it's, uh, we looked at TMA actually last middle. Uh, we actually present, uh, we had a poster with the mid, uh, TMAs, but for lung cancer. For prostate, we have not uh, uh, looked into it, but I know that there is a paper actually we cited it and regarding predicting uh, different Gleason uh, scores, I think, on uh, TMAs. I mean, why we don't uh, look much into TMAs? Because TMAs is used in research, and we are planning to have a more clinical uh, product. Cool, thanks. We have time for one or two more questions. If not, I, I was wondering, uh, do you know how, how important is the multi-resolution aspect in your compound model? Because if you just use this, the output and then apply it again at the same scale, that would also already give you more label context, which would yeah, could so also improve results. So I think like in prostate cancer, resolution is very important because it's kind of hierarchical, yeah, so there are, there are cancer cells, which are, you can see on very high resolution, and glandular, glandular uh, uh, glands, and uh, you can see on like lower resolution. So how important it is, uh, so let's say we try different experiments, like training a model on one uh, micrometer per pixel, then on two, then started with two, then one, and uh, what we noticed actually, of course, combining different resolution always helps Oh, so, okay, so w one and two or two and one was always better than one and one. I mean, we did not like, let's say, this uh, kind of like, very strict comparison, but I mean, uh, mm -hmm. we usually combine different uh, uh, resolutions, so it can be one, two, four, uh, we tried also 0 0.5, and also when we uh, ensemble, uh, we use different hyperparameters, so like finally that graph can be quite messy, but I mean, it's uh, just like, you know, simple explanation how, I mean, at least what we found one and two is uh, you can train a reasonably performing model in a reasonable time, so it's kind of more kind of for <laughs> educational purposes, I think, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, so in the interest of time, I think we should move on to the next paper. Let's thank the speaker again. So the next talk is entitled Unsupervised Lesion Detection via Image Restoration with a Normative Prior, and the first author is Su Hang Yu. Um, hi, my name is Su Hang Yu. I'm presenting uh, uh, for, the first, first, for the fourth author, and I'm presenting the paper uh, Unsupervised Lesion Detection via Image Restoration. Uh, with the normative prior. So before we start, let's do a simple test. That uh, what you see here is uh, normal brain images acquired in T2 domain from healthy subjects. And um, let's just have a rough idea of the healthy patterns of the healthy subjects. Then I will move on to give you some test images that you can immediately see there's something wrong in them. Um, and then these are the answers. So with more training, you will definitely get more accurate boundaries of this segmentation. So we know that uh, as a human being, we don't need a lot of annotations to be able to annotate um, the, the, the lesion of the, the brain images. So we're thinking it will also be great if the algorithm can also do it. So if the algorithm is also able to do it, it will, it will lead to uh, many useful applications. For example, the detection during acquisition and pre-screening. If we also want to do it like uh, conventionally using the supervised methods, we have to get exponentially large data sets to train them. Um, so this problem is also formulated as uh, unsupervised anomaly detection and many methods have been proposed to solve this problem. And our proposed method falls into the line of research uh, of the method based on generative model where we first learn a uh, normative data distribution and we check uh, when the test data comes in, does it follow the normative distribution that we estimated. Um, so to do this, uh, we have the following assumptions. Uh, the first is the image with lesions will have different features than healthy uh, images. Then, and the second is 
uh, a normative data distribution can be effectively learned by a generative model. So with, the, with these two assumptions that we know if we have an image with lesion and the image will not fit in the normative uh, data distribution as Px. Um, so before introducing the generative model, let's uh, have a look at the latent space model first. So here on the, on the left, we define a latent space Z that's uh, of, di of dimension uh, D. And then we have uh, a, a projection operator that map uh, from latent space C to the image space X. And we, learn this, uh, we, learn, we can learn this mapping from the Z to X. And if, if, the, in, if the, in the latent space we have a, di uh, a distribution, for example, a Gaussian distribution, uh, we can learn the image distribution with the equation on, on this slide. So in the deep learning field, there are two popular uh, generative models at the moment. So the first one is generative adversarial networks, and it, it uh, consists of two components. One of them is a generator that's mapped the, uh, from the latent space to the, to the image space, and then the, sec uh, the other uh, component is the discriminator, which uh, tries to tell the generator if it's generating uh, a valid image or not. So the mapping uh, overall is learned by this mean max op optimization. Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> thank you. And we have the, uh, we have the method uh, Anogam, which is based on this uh, GAN model. And they can generative, uh, it can generate relative, relative, relatively good uh, images. And uh, in the testing phase, uh, uh, it will learn, uh, uh, the, the projection operator will uh, be optimized in the latent space to find the inverse mapping from the image space back into the latent space. Uh, the problem here uh, is that uh, the inverse mapping might not always be guaranteed uh, due to possible mode collapse in GAN. And the other method, uh, the other model is version of autoencoder. So in this method, the mapping is in two way. It's, uh, it's from the image space to the latent space and back from the latent space to, to the image space. And the mapping is estimated by uh, maximizing the evidence lower bound. And uh, to detect the uh, lesion with this method, so no expl explicit uh, optimization is needed in the latent space, and the detection is uh, achieved by calculating the reconstruction error. Uh, so the, uh, the problem with this method could be that in there, there are also some cases where uh, the image is not 100% faithfully reconstructed, so we might end up with many false positives. So we go on to formulate uh, this problem as a restoration problem where we can use this uh, normative data distribution estimated by the generative model as the prior, uh, as the prior model. So specifically, our method is a two-step learn and restore method. In the first step, we uh, learn the data prior from healthy images with the VE or VE-based method. And in the second step, we perform uh, image restoration where we remove the abnormal regions from the image using the data prior that we estimated in the first step. And uh, the restoration is performed by Form, uh, formulating this maximum a posteriori problem, and the, the restoration is performed iteratively. At the end, we will have a restored image, and the lesion can be detected by calculating the absolute difference between uh, the input image and the restored image. Uh, so uh, while training a VE or VE-based method is ra uh, rather straightforward and has been demonstrated in their or original paper, so we give more details about the image restoration step. So to restore the image, we, uh, we assume uh, the lesion as, as noise. So we have the following formulation that the abnormal image consists of the normal image, uh, plus noise, which is the lesion in our case. And f uh, with this assumption, we can further formulate the maximum a posteriori problem in the, uh, in the, as the second, uh, the second equation. And this map problem can be solved by uh, gradient ascent iteratively and with the learning rate of eta. Uh, so we have the map formulation, exactly how do we calculate the two terms on the right-hand side. So we have the log Px, which is already estimated as the data prior, and then we treat the first term, the log 
PY given X as the data consistency term where we will give more details in later slides. And this can be, appro this can be approximated as the second equation where uh, we use this TV norm uh, as the data consistency term and, uh, and weight it with the lambda. And also we substitute this log PX with elbow which is estimated from a VE or VE based method of the reason for this substitution is that we cannot uh, exactly calculate the px in this term. So now we have the uh, now we have uh, we are able to calculate the two terms. Then we still need to find the empirical weight term for the data consistency. Uh, so if we perform this uh, image restoration on the healthy images, we will expect the healthy images to change the least. So we first will define um, uh, the L1 distance between the input image and the restored image as the image change. And we will find a, a, a lambda such that uh, the, the image restoration incurs the least uh, image change on the healthy data. So here we use uh, uh, a validation set that is uh, not, not a part of our training data. So the lambda can be found by generating this plot. Uh, so now we can uh, we, now we can perform uh, this uh, maximum a post, uh, maximum a posteriori problem, and we can solve it by gradient ascent. We will finally arrive at the solution of X star which is our final restoration. So uh, with this XR, we can already calculate the absolute difference between the restored image and the input image. So we will get a continuous map. But our final goal is to get the segmentation map, which is a binary map. So we need to convert the continuous map into this binary map with a threshold. So we will find the threshold such that this threshold will give us uh, a certain number of certain number of, uh, of false positives on the on the healthy data. For the reason that is during training we still don't have access to the test data, which are image with lesions. So we have to decide the threshold uh, based on uh, the healthy data alone. So uh, so this false positive rate can be uh, arbitrarily chosen for specific tasks. So uh, now we have the method. We're going to train our method and test our method on real images to ev evaluate its performance. Uh, in detail, we train our data sets, uh, uh, train our model on, uh, train on, on CamCan, which is, which, which is a data set consisting of uh, healthy subjects. And then we go on to test our, our methods on Brad's 2017. Uh, both of them are publicly available data sets. And specifically, we choose the false positive rate as 1%, 5%, and 10%. And here we uh, automatically tune the data consistent weight as 1.8. So, so here uh, in, our, in our method, we used uh, two models to learn the data prior. One of them is versional autoencoder. The other is the Gaussian mixture versional autoencoder, which has a higher uh, data representation capacity. Uh, so we, uh, we run our model, and we also compare to established, established baselines. So with the uh, detection method, uh, with the detection results, we can plot the rock curve. Uh, where we compare two baselines, for example, versional autoencoder and adversarial autoencoder and Anogan, as well as uh, Gaussian mixture model, uh, which is proposed by Limpo et al. 2001. In this plot, we can already uh, see there are three methods that is uh, well performing. One of th uh, two of them are our proposed methods, and the other one is the Gaussian mixture model. So we're going to go on to quantify uh, the, the performance of each of the methods. So in, in this table, we can see uh, the highest arc is achieved by the, our proposed method, which is the Gaussian mixture version of autoencoder with TV restoration. And we can also see that it also achieved uh, the highest die score at 5% false positive rate. So now we can see that uh, we can find we, we find the uh, Gaussian mixture version of Alden encoder with TV restoration as the best performing method. Uh, I'm going to move on to show you some uh, ex uh, visualized example of the detection of this method. 
So uh, the plot is generated at 5% uh, false positive rate, which, is the, which gives the best result of the dice scores. You can see on, on the second row is the restored method. Uh, it's the restored uh, results. We can see the restoration is relatively naive, which is just uh, reduced the intensity of the, uh, of the autonomy, but turned out it is enough to detect the, the, the lesion using this. We can see that the difference is calculated in, this, in the third row and it's better visualized as the predicted segmentation as in the fourth row here. We can see uh, comparing to the ground truth, uh, the predicted segmentation roughly matches with the uh, ground truth segmentation. Even the model has never seen an image with lesion during training. Uh, we also have one example that is also plotted using this, the same examples, but at, uh, at the false positive rate of 1%, we can see that the segmentation here is a bit limited uh, and, and is slightly worse than the performance at 5% 5 per, 5 false, false positive rate. And, and here we have the results for 10% false positive rate, uh, where we can see the uh, where, where we can see actually give us more uh, false positives, because here we choose a higher positive rate. So to conclude that uh, our proposed methods uh, detect lesion more accurately and also achieve the state of the art performance by making a more principled use of the estimated PX. And uh, possible future work could be, for example, to have a more accurate approximation of this PX instead of substituting it with the elbow estimated by versional autoencoder. And uh, other work might also be to restore the uh, underlying real anatomy instead of just reducing naively the intensity in the abnormal regions. So we thank uh, our sponsors, which, uh, which is a, a Swiss National Science Foundation. Also, we thank uh, NVIDIA for our, the GPU support. Thank you, please visit our posters. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. If it works, oh yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm here. <laughs> so the images that you showed, they were. Um, like uh, from the 3D data, they were in the middle of the 3D data, like when the brain uh, is complete. So uh, what is the performance on the whole 3D data, especially the first scans and when we don't have lesion? And uh, for the cases that the lesion is very small, does it miss them? Uh, do we have a lot of false predictions? So the question is, so if we perform this on the 3D data and when the lesion is very small, is it missed? Uh, yes, for example, yep. for the first slices, when we don't have the lesion, mm -hmm. uh, how is the prediction? And also, what is the prediction and the performance on uh, very small lesions? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, we don't explicitly show the uh, the detection results on just healthy data, but uh, in, in, experimentally we confirmed that the, on, on the healthy data, it will have some false positive rates. It will have some false positives because we choose the false positive rate on the healthy data. So it will definitely also give us some, uh, some detected lesions. Uh, for the reason that is, uh, we don't have the image with lesion during training, so that's uh, a compromise to, to generate the segmentations. And for the second question, yes, when the lesion is very small, actually it's already shown in this plot, so you can see at the uh, rightmost column, when the lesion is very, very small, it's, it's even very difficult for, for me to find it by eye. So for the, 
for the uh, for the algorithm is also very challenging. So the the, the detection performance is not very satisfying for when the lesion is extremely small. Yeah. Any other question? I had one on my side. Um, how does your lambda, or how would you would your lambda uh, training change according to the size of your lesions in your data set, and is it related to the size of your uh, lesions? I'm sorry, you reformulated. Uh, is uh, the lambda that you try to optimize to for the consistency uh, term? Yes. Is it dependent on the size of the lesion in your training set? Um, I wouldn't say it would be dependent on the size of the lesion be because uh, when we choose the lambda, it's chosen uh, empirically on the healthy data set where we don't have any lesions. Um, but I think in the, in the visualization, it might show it, has, it, it uh, performs better when the lesion is more obvious or of a relatively larger size, but I wouldn't say that it's the uh, the lambda will be uh, will prefer a lesion of a certain size. But I would just say that the lesion of a larger size is generally easy for the algorithm to pick out. Perhaps related to that, I was wondering uh, what is the effect on the, of the total variation term on, on the kind of lesions you can really segment? I, I would imagine that uh, it prefers homogeneous intensity lesions and heterogeneous mm -hmm. might become problematic. Uh, what is your experience there? Uh, yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. So in, uh, in our visualization, actually, most of them are a relatively uh, homogeneous intensity. It's I think, so uh, at the moment we have the data sets from BRAS 2017 and we took the uh, data from the T2 domain where uh, most, of the, uh, most of the lesion have a relatively homogeneous intensity, but if there are other data sets that the lesion does not appear to either to be always uh, higher intensity than normal regions, I think I will be happy to test our algorithm on that, but now just limited by our data set, we don't really have data set that have very complicated texture of the lesions. So let's all thank our speaker again. And we'll move on to the three minutes uh, talk presentation. So if all the speakers could line up and go one after the other for the three minutes talk, that would be great. Hi, so uh, I'm going to talk uh, shortly about our work on sparse structured prediction for semantic edge detection in medical images. This is a joint work with uh, Matthias Heinrich and my name is Lasse. Um, so we all know that convolutional encoder, decoder architectures like the unit are a powerful tool in medical image analysis, but we think for certain pixel level tasks like semantic edge detection or landmark detection, these architectures process images sometimes inefficiently densely. So in this work, we investigated an alternative approach where we recover dense predictions directly from a graph of image patches. Uh, I will show you in the next slides. So uh, here we consider the problem of semantic uh, edge detection in 2D medical images. And the first thing we do is to extract image patches from the input image uh, at salient key points. And these key points can be computed by simple interest operators uh, or a salient CCNN. Uh, and after that, our sparse structured prediction net uh, processes these image patches and outputs a dense semantic edge map. The whole training process is uh, guided by a supervised loss on the ground truth edge maps. So now we are going to have a, sh uh, a detailed look at the proposed SSP net. Uh, the extracted image patches are represented as node features on a distance graph that connects all sparse uh, key points, and all image patches are uh, processed uh, by the CNN encoder and structured information, here the edges, 
uh, are extracted by the CNN and structure head. And at the same time, we make use of a graph neural network to aggregate global context uh, to predict semantic classes for each image patch. Uh, we then combine those, uh, those both results and uh, aggregate all semantic edges in a single dense prediction. So uh, now some results on 10 CT slices from Visceral. Uh, we uh, report uh, the number of trainable parameters for each experiment and the F1 scores on a fixed contour threshold referred to as uh, ODS. And I would like to highlight uh, two results. Uh, one where we only used one by one convolutions and the, the other one where we used a graph neural network and we can, can clearly see an advantage of the, of the GNN uh, in an improved ODS. Uh, showing that it's advantage to, uh, to learn global geometric context. Uh, we further see that our uh, proposed uh, approach can compete with a an unit while only evaluating the, the image at 2,000 salient key points. Uh, in ongoing re uh, research, we focus on exploiting these geometric context of the, uh, of the key points uh, to boost CNN-based image registration. Uh, I thank you for your attention. I'm um, looking forward to discussions at the poster and I, finally I would like to point out that we have a position for postdoctoral researcher available. If you're interested, uh, please contact uh, Matthias Heinrich. Thanks. Um, let me, let me introduce uh, my work. Uh, our work is on care uh, class attention to regions of lesion for classification on imbalance data. And uh, uh, to date, uh, it's still an uh, open and challenging problem for intelligent diagonal systems to learn from imbalance data, especially with uh, large samples of common diseases and uh, much smaller, smaller samples uh, of rare diseases. Uh, in our works, we have two, two data sets. Uh, the one is the skin lesion data set. Uh, we can see the, uh, the most uh, common disease have uh, 6,705 uh, 6, 6, images, and uh, while the, the most uh, rare disease have uh, 115 diseases. And uh, the other data set is the pneumonia data set uh, is uh, uh, the same as the, the skin lesion data set. And uh, so we propose, uh, propose the, uh, a new approach, a uh, new approach uh, to Im embed attention to the, to the minor class, uh, minor class uh, to, uh, to, to promote its uh, uh, its uh, performance, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the framework with uh, contains two branch. Uh, the one branch, uh, the one branch focus attention into the lesion uh, lesion regions and uh, in minor class uh, with uh, the bounding box. Uh, note that the bounding box is uh, only only provi provided. Uh, provided uh, on the minor class uh, on during training. There are two loss functions we used uh, in our, you are used, uh, our, we used uh, to train, train our networks. Uh, one is the general cross entropy loss uh, to, uh, for the class file. And uh, the other is the attention loss we used uh, to uh, used to attend to the legion, uh, legion regions. Uh, and in practice, uh, we, the attention loss can be split by uh, split to two lo loss items, the inner loss and the outer loss. Uh, the inner loss helps the class buyer learn to attend the legion regions, and uh, the outer loss helps the class buyer to decrease attention outside the Region regions and uh, uh, the uh, least two loss items can given can be given by the uh, the activation map and and uh, the the mass generated from the uh, bounding box on my 
on minor class. And uh, uh, our experiments show that uh, our KL model outperforms the three wi widely used uh, methods for data imbalance. Uh, the cost, cost sensitive loss, loss and the uh, focal loss and uh, the data augmentation. And in addition, uh, our approach can boost the performance of those methods. Uh, 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 in addition, the care model can learn to the focus on the legion regions. Thank you. Hello, um, I would like, I'm Nicolas, and I would like to talk to you again about joint learning of brain lesion and anatomy segmentation from a heterogeneous data set. Um, so um, <clears throat> the joint learning program is basically uh, when you want, we want to have a model that performs uh, segmentation on two different tasks. In this case, for example, is uh, anatomical uh, segmentation and lesion segmentation of uh, white matter hyperintensities. Uh, but we only have training data sets that have either the anatomical tissues or the lesion, se lesion segmentation, right? Um, basically, this is a problem because if you want to train a regular unit uh, with regular cross entropy with this, it works really bad. Um, so I'm going to uh, post two solutions we came up. Uh, the first one is very simple. It's just uh, you train one, one network with an anatomical data set and another network on the lesion data set. And then when you get a new image, you basically just compute the anatomical segmentation and the lesion segmentation, and you paste the lesions on top of the anatomical segmentation, and then you get your result, right? Uh, this works really well because uh, each, each network only performs one task. Uh, but we have the, the downside that we have two networks, so we have double the cost to, um, to evaluate new images. And there are a lot of drawbacks. We have twice the parameters. Uh, so what we wanted to do is to get a single model that has the same performance as this one, but uses only one network. So what we proposed is to use, uh, we adapted the, the traditional cross entropy. Uh, by looking at where are the problems when we try to train a single model. The problems happen when, uh, when you have a, a lesion image and you have lesion background. Uh, this lesion background is something that you show the model that it is. Um, in, in some images, you say this is white matter or gray matter, and the other one, you say this is background, right? This is what confuses the model. So basically, what we did is we proposed a, a new function that unifies the lesion background by saying, the only thing I know about this is that it's not, not lesion, right? So we just want to maximize uh, the score that the model assigns to the, um, the rest of the classes, right? So these are pretty much our results. This is the ground truth. This is if you train a model uh, with regular cross entropy. This is if you use two different networks. And this is if you use our custom cross entropy. Uh, in some cases, even we managed to outperform the, the two different networks. This is because our single networks saw two different data sets, so it's a bit more robust to the domain changes. Uh, so a couple of takeaways is uh, the, the key to our, to our work was to understand the contradictions that were happening during the training. Um, then we achieved comparable segmentation using one single network to compared to using two different networks. Uh, we even outperformed them in some cases due to being more robust to the multi-domain problem. And we experimented this uh, on two different scenarios, uh, white matter hyperintensities and tumors. Uh, we got consistent results on both cases. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Todd, and I would like to show you how we've demonstrated domain randomization for the first time in medical imaging. And this was a collaborative work between Siemens and uh, King's. 
So what you see here is our network from last IPCAI, actually, that is able to register cardiac model to an interventional cardiac X-ray image. Um, and this happens in a way that the clinicians acquire the X-ray image, then a segmented prior model from MR or CT data is taken and projected out into the same plane as the X-ray image was taken in. Uh, then these two images are shown to a neural network that predicts the next action, and this happens in an iterative fashion. So if you iterate a few times, then you can see on the right, the mesh or the model will be moving closer and closer to the final uh, ideal alignment. However, there is a problem here. It seems to be working in most of the cases. However, if you look at the images, uh, our x-rays that we apply, our agromon, look quite different uh, compared to the training data that we've used. We've trained fully on synthetic images, right? And those are real x-rays. So uh, in the results, there will be obviously some, some difference if you train fully on real data or fully on synthetic. And this is what we call the reality gap, right? So how can we bridge this? The natural way would be to try to simulate more realistic images. However, we chose a different approach. And this is domain randomization, right? So. In the first step, we have uh, randomized the intensity of our generated DR images. You can see here, so we are generating unrealistic uh, X-ray images. And then in the second step, we have um, randomized for the collimation. So we are generating random borders, as you can see there, with random colors, so sometimes white, gray, or black. Um, and through the, the domain randomization, what we hope to achieve and we have achieved is that the, the real X-rays appear to the network just as another variation of the data. So as you can see here in the top row, these were our previous results in some cases, and domain randomization seemed to have uh, helped in these particular ones. And if you look at the quantitative results, uh, what you see on the left, these are results on individual patients, so 21 patients, from uh, two uh, train networks with our initial setup without domain randomization. And as you can see, we varied one uh, parameter here. That was the initialization of the weights at the beginning of the training. And we received completely different results if we were looking at the, the uh, robustness of this registration for the individual cases. However, when we perform the domain randomization, we can see that it has worked in these cases and the robustness improves significantly, but that's just one thing. The other thing is that we receive consistent results for different training parameters. So we have kind of managed to bridge the reality gap. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to start with the question, not that question, do segmentation algorithms in pathology really require labor and knowledge intensive manual annotations? Well, before we can answer a question like this, we have to define and look at the most common annotation types used in digital pathology. Um, the first one are dense annotations where in predefined region, in, in a predefined region of interest, all, annot all pixels are annotated. Um, in the second one, we can cherry pick our annotations throughout the entire whole slide image. This, of course, means that we can easily annotate a lot of regions because there's no need to focus on uh, tissue tr transitions. <coughs> However, this is also, of course, bad because we don't have tissue necessarily have tissue transitions in our data set. There are also a lot of non-annotated pixels in the, in the training set. To overcome this issue, we uh, can go to a dense data set where we have these transitions between the different tissue types. However, this of course means more knowledge to go uh, to set the defined border between the different tissue types and is of course more uh, label intensive. We try to overcome this issue to, uh, by introducing two loss balancing methods to train a segmentation model on sparse annotations and compare it to a very simple non-balancing method um, where only annotated pixels are taken into account, as shown on the left bottom. Um, the first balancing method, for some reason it keeps continuing to the next slide. Uh, for so, uh, the, uh, the first balancing method is relatively simple where every, the weight of the pixel is uh, calculated based on the class occurrence per 
uh, patch. The second balancing method is the, the weight per pixel is calculated based on the uh, class occurrence per mini batch. And we try to, uh, we, we apply these three balancing methods, or two balancing methods, to a 13 class segmentation task uh, trained on three different uh, annotation for da data sets. The first is sparse annotations, uh, annotations only, dense annotations only, or a combination between the two, but relatively small amount of dense annotations. Um, if you look at the results, we can see that the results actually are quite similar uh, throughout all the methods with different annotation types. This is something that we also see when we look at the quantitative results, where the, very, the overall die score is uh, more or less equal to each other. So coming back to the question, do we really need uh, <laughs> the labor-intensive and time-intensive annotations? Uh, for this particular task, I would say that, yes, we do need very labor-intensive annotations, however, not as much as one might think. And I would like to invite you to the poster for discussion later on. So this then concludes our session. I'd like to thank all the speakers, and uh, it's lunch now. See you back here at 2.30.